minutes, we're about to go live, so... So, welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council on Thursday the 22nd of September 2022, whether you are attending remotely or in person. My name is Councillor Anna Bradnam and I'm the Chair of South Cambridgeshire District Council. Uh, my Vice Chair today is Peter, Councillor Peter Fane. May I now make a few house, housekeeping announcements. Please make sure that all mobile phones are switched to silent. Your microphones should be kept switched off unless you're invited to speak. For those participating remotely, when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure that your microphone and camera are switched on. And when you've finished addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone and camera immediately. Please would members who are attending remotely indicate a wish to speak through a chat message in the Teams meeting. Those present in the chamber should indicate their wish to speak by raising their hand. And I'll ask the vice chair to note the order of speakers both virtually and in the room. The chat facility should not be used for any other purposes except where necessary to write down a simple amendment. Complex amendments should have been shared with democratic services in advance of the meeting. When we move to a vote on any item and there's not clear affirmation, I'll state that a recorded vote will be taken. Members in the chamber will then vote electronically, selecting for, against, or abstain. The, res the result will be displayed on our screens. So officers have confirmed that the meeting is court and that we can proceed. So item one is apologies. Um, uh, Ms Dobson, are there any apologies for absence? Thank you, Chair. Yes, the apologies for absence received so far are from councillors Michael Atkins, Henry Batchelor, Paul Bearpark, Sarah Chung Johnson, Libby Earle, Bill Handley, Alex Mullion, and Councillor Bridget Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I understand we may also have apologies from members in your group. So, Mark Howell, and also from our group, uh, I understand Will Jackson Wood. Aidan? And Annika Osborne as well. Sorry, and? Annika Osborne as well. Annika Osborne. Okay. Thank you. If I may check, Councillor Bill Handley is online, uh, but he's having trouble with his audio, so he just sent a message in the chat. And also, I understood that Councillor Libby Earle was likely to be taking part online. Can I just check if Libby Earle is online? No, nope, doesn't sound like it. Not at the moment. Okay. Item two is declarations of interest. So, do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? If an interest is subsequently becomes apparent later on in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point. But anybody got any interest at the moment? Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to the item on the GCP, item 13, uh, I sit on the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly. Thank you very much. And uh, item three, standing item, register of interest. This is important, members, as your responsibilities change. Please may I remind members that you need to keep your register of interests up to date and that you should inform democratic services of any changes. Thank you. So item four is the minutes which are on pages one to ten of our agenda papers. Members are asked to approve the minutes of the meeting of the council held on the 21st of July 2022. Can I just clarify um, if we have, if we're happy to approve? Or would you like me to go through them page by page? Are there any amendments that members wish to make? No, I can't see any hands. So, members, are we happy to approve these minutes by affirmation? Agreed. Sorry, yes. Sorry, yes. Um, I'm, <laughs> happy. Um, I'm happy to second the minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, so... Having had that approval by affirmation, seconded by Judith, can we just firmly 
formally confirm that we do approve the minutes by affirmation. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and nobody, anybody wishing to vote against that or abstain? No. Okay. So the council therefore agrees the approval of the minutes by 20, oh, sorry, the minutes of the 21st of July 2022 as a, um, as a correct record by affirmation. Thank you. Item five is the announcements. Um, the first one is that I would like to announce, uh, finally, my chair's charity. Um, apologies for the delay, members. Um, somebody may, suggested they should all turn their photo phones on and ring each other to maximise the income to my benevolent fund. I'm going to choose the Trussell Trust again. Members will remember, older members will remember that uh, ex-Councillor De Lacey, um, past Chairman De Lacey, uh, chose the Trussell Trust. Um, I'm happy to do the same again this year because we know that residents are suffering, so, facing such um, anxiety with regard to the cost of living, the cost of fuel, and <coughs> providing their families with food. And I note just one item of data, May 2022, the Cambridge Food Bank provided 1,205 people with an emergency food parcel just in May this year. So um, that's my um, trust, for, uh, my charity for this year. And um, remember, members, if you want to pay into that, I must obtain for you the sort code and account number from accounts, but I can do so very quickly and I will send it to you by email. Thank you. Right. Uh, Deputy Leader, do you have any uh, items to announce? Okay, um, thank you. I have some really exciting news and um, I'm sure you all wish um, Michael Atkins, Councillor Michael Atkins and his wife Becky, congratulations and best wishes. Their daughter was born on Friday, just gone, and she's called Lucy Elizabeth. Are there any announcements from members of the cabinet? Can't see any. Right. So, um, head, head of paid service? No. Okay. So, um, members, uh, there is a public speaker waiting to speak to us today. Doc Councillor Dave Sargent, who is sorry, David Sargent, who is a member of the parish council at West Wickham, uh, who will be sorry. Should I say he was part of the neighbourhood plan team? who will make a statement in relation to the item on the making of the West Wickham Neighbourhood Plan. And as has been our practice on previous occasions, I, it would appear appropriate to hear his statement at the point when we consider the item on the Neighbourhood Plan. Um, and accordingly, I propose that we move the order of business um, on, on the agenda such that we allow item nine to be considered immediately after item six, which is public speaking. So, um, may I now call for a seconder to that? Yes. Councillor Hawkins, I think. Uh, I do second that, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody wish to vote against that change of the agenda? No. Good, okay, and anybody wish to abstain? Thank you. So, we agree that motion to move the position on the agenda. Thank you very much. So item six is questions from the public. Uh, we have two public speakers and there is a question from Mr. Daniel Clark and the statement to be made by Councillor Dave Sargent on behalf of West Wickham Parish Council. And details of these can be found in the second supplement agenda pack, which was issued to us on the 16th of September, I believe. Um, so is Mr. Clark present in the room or is he online? Mr. Clark? Daniel Clark, are you online? Uh, you may be muted because we can't hear you.
Hello? Ah, hello? <laughs> Do you, uh, hello? Uh, is that Daniel Clark? It is, yeah. Sorry, I'm sitting in a lay-by, so apologies. You're in a lay-by? Wonders of modern IT. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're a wee bit quiet, um, so... If you is that a bit it, louder? That's better, thank you. So, okay, um, sorry about that. Mr. Clark, I hope you're safe in your lay-by. Um, would you like to um, ask your question? Yeah, please, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair, for taking the question, thank you. Um, my question is about the four-day working week trial. Um, I'm mindful that the Council has its own language and words, and I've read various documents, and I might use different words and phrases, which are not Council speak, but hopefully my question will make sense. Um, I guess if the public sees anything about the scheme, um, it's via local newspapers and public messaging, neither of which really disclose a great deal, hence my questions, as this is a huge moment for any employer, but particularly for one that's got legal service responsibilities. Um, as the chair would know, and others in attendance might not know, I submitted a number of questions about the scheme. Um, I'm grateful that the Democratic Service Manager, I think I've got that title right, has passed the full list on to officers for them to reply, which is fair enough. And I appreciate these replies are not made public, but I don't mind if they are. I fully accept staffing is a huge issue and that sitting still is not the answer. And I applaud the council to actually start thinking differently. I might have a slightly different opinion on what the answer could be, but I'm not party to the inner workings and pressures of the South Cans. Although I think I'm probably right in framing the scheme, part of the issue is dealing with your equality Mr. element Clark, of job pay Mr. scale Clark, legislation. Would you, like, would you like to get on with your question, please? I, yeah, I'm, I'm almost there. The Thank premise you. of the trial is to attract and retain staff, and I do get that. But my question, first question is, does the four-day week apply to all desk-based admin staff, including the chief executive, section 151 officer, and other senior team members? Thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, so um, that question needs to go to uh, the deputy leader. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark, for your question. Um, the four day working week is in the process of planning currently and will be trialled, as you've mentioned, for office based staff only in the first instance from January to March of next year. And that is from the, the full range of office day, um, based staff. Much of their work goes way beyond admin tasks, but is principally work that is carried out at a desk. As a council and as a picture nat nationally, we are facing difficulties in recruitment and retention, which means we are spending two million pounds a year on 23 full-time or equivalent agency workers to fill gaps where possible. Clearly, this is not ideal, not efficient, and we have to pay the agency fees, and also, this cannot always provide the continuity of service that we believe is important in serving our residents. To do nothing and not to trial this innovative approach is not an option. We live in an area with high employment levels where housing is expensive and cannot compete with the private sector on salaries. <coughs> South Cambridgeshire District Council has to offer something different to attract more permanent staff. Importantly, if those 23 positions were filled by our own employees rather than agency workers, that would cost the council £1 million less, which would mean that extra million could go towards grants and services to support our residents in the difficult times ahead. Thank you, Deputy Leader. Uh, Mr Clark, do you have a supplementary question? Yeah, I do. I mean, thank you for that. I mean, I, I could, we could spend a long time arguing over uh, the million quid and, and other things, but I have read all the documents that are available. And obviously the outcome of the trial is to reduce the actual working time for each employee. I understand that. But I'm commenting on the output side. This is what the service user sees. It's what I see. So by default, the trial reduces the total resource available to be applied to each service. In simple terms, if you're a planning officer and you have four standard days instead of five standard days. So my follow up question is, of course, I want the scheme to work. I'm not commenting on trial length. I'm not commenting on the effective 20 cent pay rise for three months. I'm not commenting 
on the impact it has on other councils and services. I'm not commenting on the inconsistencies in the announcement. My follow-up is to cover the output as experienced by a resident. So, Mr. Clark, my guess you come to your question? Is, Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. My guess is the amount of council work staff will face will not decrease by 20% over such a short period. Either the resource will need to generate an increase in productivity or users of the service will have to accept a slower response or some services will not be serviced at all. So my question is, with the same unambiguous confidence that the council said there'll be no financial cost implication of this scheme, can the council confirm that there'll be no drop in service outcomes as experienced by residents across all services having reduced the resource to provide those services by 20%. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. Uh, Councillor, uh, Deputy Leader. Right, I think I've caught the um, gist of your question, if not every single word. Um, this is a trial, as I've said, and there will not be a drop. If there is a drop, this will not go ahead. It's going to be carefully monitored by key performance indicators, which we use as a method to um, analyze the performance of the council. And the hope is it will actually increase the productivity because of um, being able to work more efficiently and also um, with happier, more better health and well-being. That always puts, puts out a better sort of product in the end. And that's the idea behind it. Um, so n not sort of endless hours of work, but more productive hours of work. And the whole premise of the scheme is 100% of the work in 80% of the time, 100% of the pay. And this is being monitored extremely carefully by officers. And I'm quite sure my colleague um, on Cabinet Peter McDonald will be looking very closely at those key performance indicators in the initial trial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Leader. Thank you for your um, questions, Mr. Clark. Um, So, um, moving on then, as we agreed to item nine, which is the uh, proposed making of the West Wickham Neighbourhood Plan. This is on pages 19 to 122 of our agenda pack. Is now exiting. Thank you. And uh, I believe Mr. Sargent is attending in person. Uh, um, good afternoon. Yes, thank you, Chair. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> so, Mr. Sergeant, Councillor Sergeant, may I ask you to make your statement, please? That's certainly. Uh, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of West Wickham Parish Council, um, we obviously welcome the adoption of our neighbourhood plan. Um, we think its policies will help ensure that future development in West Wickham uh, meets the needs of the community, is environmentally sustainable, and uh, protects the character of the parish. Um, developing our plan has taken countless hours of volunteer time and um, the, they gave their time freely and enthusiastically, and the parish council is enormously grateful to them. Um, we also benefited from the, the broad engagement of the wider community. Um, and it's clear that our parishioners care very deeply about where they live, and they, they're very thoughtful in the complicated issues that face planning decisions in, in very small villages like ours. Uh, we have been very well supported while we've been developing our plan, not only by our, our district councillor, um, but also by the officers in the uh, planning policy team at the Shared Planning Service. Um, and I'd particularly like to express my thanks to uh, Alison Talkington, who's worked with us from right from 2015 until her recent retirement, and she was, continually gave us uh, enormous levels of support and technical assistance. Um, our plan uh, gained over 90% support at referendum from those that voted. And, and fundamentally, that's because it was able to offer a vision for the future of the village that matches what people want. Um, and we were only able to achieve that in our plan because the local plan has a sustainable vision for the very smallest villages in the district. Um, so we really look forward to seeing a new local plan emerge that's compatible and continues to work well with our neighbourhood plan over the next decade by continuing that theme of 
of sustainability really at the core of for the very smallest parishes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Sergeant, and for all your hard work. Uh, so, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, um, I believe, is going to present the report and move the recommendation. Yes, thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, just to say today, in my view, is another good day in the journey of neighbourhood plan making in South Cambridgeshire District. We have so far made five neighbourhood plans, and today we have the pleasure of bringing forward, hopefully, the sixth. You have heard Councillor Sargent um, you know, talk about some of their journey uh, getting to this stage, and I want to thank him and all the members of the working group and those who took part in it to get it to this stage. There's a lot of hard work. Um, when we bear in mind that West Wickham was designated as a neighborhood area way back in November 2015. And of course, following all the work that they've done, it came back to us in December 2021 for the formal adoption stage to start. And I think you'll see from the uh, report that uh, the referendum that was held on the 11th of August had a turnout of 30% of the residents, which is good. And a resounding 91.59% voted for it, uh, which was even, I think, higher than the last one that we did. Um, and since we had to adopt the plan within eight weeks of the referendum, it's why it's coming to you today. I must say I was quite impressed with the vision that was expressed um, in the neighborhood plan. And I'll refer you to page 43 of our report, of our papers, which summarizes it as the ambition to enhance the lives of the current and future residents by protecting the rural character of the parish, the balance of built agricultural and natural landscapes, and its diverse wildlife and tranquility. And of course, this vision is underpinned by two objectives. The first one is to protect and enhance the natural and historic environment of the parish. And the parish is one of those beautiful linear settlements that's along a, um, along a ridge and it's got you know, slopes down the side. So yeah, <laughs> has its own unique facilities there. Um, and that particular objective is being supported by eight out of the 11 policies. So it's quite important. <laughs> um, and the second objective aims to sustain a diverse and thriving community with policies that support and facilitate improvements in the provision of community facilities and to deliver a housing mix that meets the need of West Wickham. And I think those are for smaller units as well. Um, just one thing that I wanted to highlight actually is their policy WWK stroke six, which states that development proposals which include external lighting will only be permitted if the night sky is protected from light pollution. And this is to allow new development to be in keeping with the unlit nature of the village and protect it and protect the nocturnal wildlife. So again, you know, it's not just the character, it's also um, biodiversity. I mean, I always learn something new with each of the um, neighborhood plans that we've adopted. Um, and this is no different. And it's why our district, I think, is one of the most desirable places to live in the country. Um, so neighborhood plans, once they're made, which is the word for adopting it, <laughs> I don't know why that is, it becomes a part of our adopted local plan and carries statutory planning weight when it comes to decision making on applications that come forward in that area. And this, Today, if we adopt it, will help us uh, and our development teams as they work in future uh, on applications in West Wickham. Now, at this stage, I wish to acknowledge and thank Alison Torkington, who's been the planning policy officer responsible for neighborhood plans for as long as I can remember. She retired last month. Uh, we're gonna miss her, <laughs> but um, just to say the work, uh, the excellent work that she's doing will is carrying on being done by members of the planning policy team. 
So at this point, Chair, I heartily move the recommendations in paragraph 4A and 4B on page 19 of our agenda papers um, and ask members present to please fully support the making today of the West Wickham Neighbourhood Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr. Tina Hawkins. Uh, may I call for a seconder? I would second, thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey, uh, would you like to speak now or reserve your right to speak? Uh, yes, I will speak now, if I may. Thank you. Um, well, this report um, runs to more than 90 pages. Um, and I think it's, it's just a, a beautifully presented report, apart from anything else, um, in terms of its contents. Um, and of course, uh, it has to be very carefully constructed because and I think the way it meshes with the local plan takes a local plan forward and also um, down to a, a local level um, is um, sort of testament for why the, the neighborhood plan um, uh, um, process is, is, is so such a good one. Um, and because of the amount of work involved, I mean, it really has taken a huge time and commitment from um, all sorts of people. I've um, heard Councillor Hawkins talk about um, all the input that's come from our officers. Um, you know, I'd like to talk a bit about um, all of the uh, commitment over a huge period of time um, from residents uh, in West Wickham. Um, firstly, I'd like to say um, thank you to Dave Sargent, who's um, here this evening. And as Parish Council, I've witnessed his um, sort of monthly uh, updates on the progress of the um, neighbourhood plan and, and all of the sort of hurdles and uh, procedural process that it's had to go through. Um, and, and over that period, um, you know, the others um, probably uh, I should mention also, um, Trevor Hall um, previously, also um, Janet um, and Andrew Morish, um, Paris Council Chair Alex Schulenberg and, and before him, um, for, for a large part of this um, uh, process, um, Patrick Charlton. And, and I think um, it, it's um, just a fantastic piece of work and I want to congratulate um, all the residents of West Wickham on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Harvey. So, um, having been moved and seconded, we're open for debate. I believe uh, if anybody else would like to raise, um, to raise anything, please raise your hands, but I understand Councillor Heather Williams would like to speak. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very brief. Um, I think congratulations to everybody that's done all the work on this. Um, we, all we have to do today is just say agreed, I think. Um, so the, I think the honour should be with those involved in it very much so. Um, and uh, I'm sure all the uh, planning committee members are looking forward to using and applying it. Um, and actually a thanks from us on planning committee help if uh, we have a steer from the local community in, in such a way that uh, we can lean on and give weight, I believe, Chair, is what we'd be told to do. So uh, thank you for making our lives a bit easier, actually. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. Um, so I also would like to congratulate uh, all those people who've worked hard in the village of West Wickham for producing this neighbourhood plan. Um, and let's move to Sorry, because I know how much work it is. In my own village, uh, in my own ward, we've had one of these, and it, they take years to do, and a lot of commitment from people who give their time freely. So thank you very much to everybody. So, can we take this by affirmation, or do we need to go to a vote? Affirmation, agreed. Is anybody wishing to vote, say, against, or abstain? No? Okay, great. So. With that, then, um, I uh, note that we have accepted and approved the, that we make the West Wickham Neighbourhood Plan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for attending, Mr. Sergeant. That's great. Okay, so... With that happy move, we move on to item seven on the agenda, There are, which is petitions, and no petitions have been received. So item 8A is uh, on 
page 11 of our agenda, back to page 11, folks, which is the 2021 Provisional Housing Revenue Account Outturn. And may I call, uh, this is the recommendation of the 12th of September 2022, and may I call on Councillor John Williams, the lead cabinet member for finance, to present the report and move the recommendation. So, Councillor John Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'd like to move this report. Um, it's the annual report on the HRA uh, revenue and capital uh, account. And I will draw members' attention to the table on page 12, which uh, gives the uh, revenue account um, um, against the, the budget. And as you can see, um, there is a slight um, difference, but by and large, um, it was on, on budget. And then if you look at table um, on page 13, uh, that gives the uh, capital um, um, outturn. And as you can see, um, there was some uh, slippage and um, some 2.7 million variation uh, due to slippage. And that was mainly down to Strawberry Farm, uh, Great Abington, uh, which is the, in our housing uh, programme. Unfortunately, the contract was not agreed as expected, so that has slipped into the next financial year. But otherwise, a very satisfactory situation, and I do hope the Council will approve it. Thank you very much, Councillor John Williams. May I call for a seconder? Thank you, Councillor John Batchelor. Would you like to speak now? Or yes, I'll speak now, please. Thank you, uh, Thank you Councillor Chairman. Batchelor. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, John. That, that was all good news. Um, a budget surplus, I, I'd like to stress. So, uh, an excess of £2 million. And the point I'd like to make there, this, this is the account for 21 22. And it's against the background of all the challenges of COVID. So, I think this is uh, um, to get so close to our budget. Outturn is, is uh, you know, a, a compliment to all the staff involved in that. Um, I'd also like, like to make the point uh, that the budget for housing is met exclusively from the rental income. So, uh, new build, the repairs, uh, the repayment of uh, debt, all these things are met through rents exclusively. And this, again, is a huge um, achievement. Um, and I think uh, we should all uh, note that. Uh, a particular uh, achievement, I think, was the maintenance of our new build um, projects. Even with COVID uh, and with uh, number of the projects running over into 22-23, we still achieved a record 89 completions. This is well done to Kirstin Donaldson and her team who have uh, delivered for us in very challenging circumstances. So thank you to them. Uh, thank you, Lee. Thank you very much, Councillor John Batchelor. Um, has been drawn to my attention that there is a, a correction that we just need to note in paragraph 14. Thank you to Councillor Carla Hoffman for this. Um, that it refers to external wall insulation at Musgrave Way in Tevisham, but Musgrave Way is in fact in Fenditton, so we just need to correct that. I know that because it's in my ward and I planted our Jubilee tree there. So, um, if we could just change Tavisham to Fenditton. Thank you. So, can we open for debate then? Would anybody like to speak on this? Oh, only me then. Right. So, so uh, with no f requests to discuss, <laughs> then um, can I suggest that we're content to take this decision by affirmation? Agreed. Agreed. And uh, does anybody wish to vote against that proposal? No? Or abstain? So, therefore, this council agrees this motion by affirmation. Thank you very much, members.
So um, I note with pleasure that Susan, Councillor Susan van der Ven has just been able to join the meeting. And I just wanted to ask you, Councillor van, van der Ven, if you have any interest to declare in any items on the agenda. No. <laughs> okay. If, if anything occurs to you later, do say. Right, so the next item on the agenda is item 10, which is appointment to the independent remuneration panel. And this came in the supplement that was issued on the 16th of September. Good afternoon. Um, so, so um, thank you. Can I just sorry. call upon <laughs> the chief? I was just getting my paperwork sorted out. So it's oh, on the oh, supplementary agenda pack, um, pages 1 to 12. And thank you, Peter. Uh, I'll be delighted to call upon you, Chief Finance Officer Peter Maddock, to present the report. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, so the report itself recommends the appointment uh, for a three-year term from the 1st of October 2022 of two members uh, to the independent remuneration panel. Um, the regulations that govern this require that the council establish a panel um, of at least three members and traditionally we have had three members uh, and the purpose of the panel is to make recommendations in respect of members allowances and the council has a duty on it to um, have regard for those recommendations that are made. The current chair, um, Graham Jagger, uh, his term is due to expire at the end of this month. And he notified us uh, a few weeks back that he was unable to seek renewal of his term. The current uh, allowance uh, scheme that we have in place um, actually ran out at the end of the last financial year. So it is actually necessary for a full review to be undertaken this year and preferably as soon as we possibly can. So in order for us to be able to um, move ahead with that uh, as quickly as possible, um, we carried out uh, a short notice recruitment exercise, uh, and that was uh, to replace the vacancy that has arisen. So those interviews were carried out week commencing the 12th of September, and there were three candidates that were interviewed, and of the three, two of those were suitable. Um, and it was felt that in order to increase the resilience and capacity uh, and the fact that time was of the essence in relation to the review, it would be best to appoint both members to the panel um, for the reasons that I've just, just stated. Um, and as I say, this will enable us to complete the review as quickly and, and practically as possible uh, so that it can feed into the budget process 23-24. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Maddock. Um, I am going to second this uh, proposal uh, to retain its independence. Um, so would anybody like to speak on this item? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry. Sorry, I do apologise. I believe Councillor John Williams is uh, we'll move this recommendation. Sorry, I apologise for that. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm formally moving this because obviously um, the Chief Financial Officer as an officer cannot move uh, this uh, recommendation. Uh, but before I do so, um, I would like to uh, thank uh, Graham Jagger, the outgoing uh, Chair um, of the Remuneration, uh, Independent Remuneration Panel. Um, I mean, Graham um, has had 35 years of uh, management and consultancy experience, both in public and private sector organisations, including the NHS, and was actually appointed uh, by this council uh, to its independent remuneration committee in September 2008. Um, so, and he became chair of the panel in 2011. So, you know, he has done us great service. Um, and, he assured, and he has ensured that the panel has made an annual recommendation on members' allowances uh, to this council and assisted in the uh, recruitment process when new members of the panel were needed. So I would 
greatly thank, and I am sure you will join in me in thanking him for his service to this council. Um, I will then go on to formally move uh, the recommendation in the report. Thank you very much, Councillor Williams. And now I second the uh, proposal. Members, would anybody like to speak on this? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. And just leading from the comments from the lead member for finance, I think he said about us all echoing, I'm sure we would all echo our thanks for such a long period of time. Um, given it's an independent panel, Chair, I don't know if it's appropriate, but perhaps as Chair on behalf of all of us, you could thank, uh, write a letter to thank for all the support that's been given over the years. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, it was my... Thank you. Uh, it's my intention to thank also Graham Jagger for his long service uh, and we look forward to the um, new panel members taking their roles. Um, but no further debate. Um, does anyone wish to vote against that recommendation? Uh, so are we happy that we take that by affirmation? Agreed. And no one wishes to vote against that proposal? Or abstain? No. no. Good. So this council therefore agrees the motion by affirmation. Thank you very much, members. That's item 10. Um, item 11 is the review, the, rev the review of proportionality and allocation of seats on committees, which is also in this same agenda pack, published on the 16th of September, starting on page 13. Uh, may I call on the Democratic Services Manager, Rebecca Dobson, to present the report, please. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Chair. Um, the principle of proportionality on the Council requires a review of the allocation of seats to the political groups as soon as practicable after a change in the composition of the political groups on the Council. Therefore, following the notification from Councillor Dan Lentel, to the proper, proper officer of his resignation from the Liberal Democrat group, a review of political proportionality was required. Um, so this report refers to that review. It sets out the um, order in which the principles laid down in the, in the relevant legislation apply regarding the allocation of seats, as you can see in paragraph six. And importantly, the overall allocation of seats based on the proportionality um, has to be um, allocated to each political group on the council. So moving down that report, you will see that the number of seats with that change results at paragraph nine, showing Liberal Democrats 36 seats, Conservatives eight seats, and the unaligned member, the independent member, one seat. And as the political balance of the council needs to be calculated by basing that proportionality on the grouped councillors, so 44 councillors, um, that gives, as set out in paragraph 11, the proportions for the Liberal Democrat group of 81.818% and the Conservative group 18.182%. Moving through that report, um, it obviously sets out the allocation of the 62 seats on the committees, applying that proportionality across all of that um, allocation of 62 seats. The Liberal Democrat group is entitled to 51 in all, and the Conservative group to 11 seats, totaling 62. Uh, the allocation is then applied across the committees, and in order to ensure that the aggregate amount is um, reflected correctly, you will see in the appendices at the end of that report, uh, first of all, uh, figures in brackets in Table 1 showing the exact calculation per committee based on that proportionality. And as a result, you can see that um, if you added them up by rounding up everything, it would come to the slightly wrong allocation. Therefore, as stated in the report, um, it's necessary to uh, confer across the groups and to base the ultimate decision on the recommendation from the political groups. Table 2, therefore, sets out the proposed committee seat allocation. Um, showing the recommendation of the political groups that one additional seat be on the scrutiny and overview committee um, allocated to the Conservative group. And this reflects the fact that the uh, figures would have been um, either way an additional seat or a less, uh, fewer seats uh, across two committees, licensing and scrutiny and overview committee. 
Um, so to make that very clear, I hope in table two, um, the allocations that are recommended are set out there and you will see for um, the licensing committee that that will stay the same with the Liberal Democrats allocation of 12 and the Conservative allocation of two. But for the scrutiny committee, scrutiny and overview committee rather, the Liberal Democrat allocation is now 11 and the Conservative one is recommended to be three. Moving down to the final uh, appendix for this, um, it sets out the uh, names of those members to whom um, it is proposed that these seats be allocated. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Dobson. Uh, so, are there any... Um, this... Sorry. Would anybody like to raise any issues about that? see any requests. <laughs> um, so, members then, um, can I bring to you then the recommendations on page 13? Yes, oh, sorry, yes, that's a good point. I need to collect my brain, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, um, I'm proposing this. Uh, so, the pro the, I propose the recommendations which are set out at page 13 of the supplementary pack and are elucidated in paragraph three of that page, which refers to Appendix A and Appendix D, uh, E, B. May I have a seconder? I second that, Chair. Thank you very much. So, members, are we content to take this decision by affirmation? Thank you. Uh, anyone wishing to vote against or to abstain? Thank you. So, therefore, the Council agrees the motion uh, at item 11 by affirmation. Thank you. So, item 12 then is uh, the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority uh, report, which is on page 123 uh, to 128 of our paper, uh, of our agenda papers. And the Council is invited to note the report on the work of the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority as outlined in the agenda. So firstly, do our representatives on the Combined Authority have any comments that they wish to make? Um, Councillor Judith Griffith, Deputy Leader. Let's just make a short, brief statement. Okay, our representative on the Combined Authority, Councillor Bridges Smith, could not be here today as I have mentioned or is obvious, um, but several other people involved in the work of the Combined Authority are here, so we'll be happy to respond or attempt to respond to any questions. The work on the improvement plan is progressing well under the new Chief Executive and Governance Officers. The Authority had to return funding to Government for two programmes to improve the environmental performance of homes. We have been working to make sure that appropriate lessons are learned from this experience. As you will have heard, Stagecoach has announced that several vital bus services are to be cut despite the efforts of board members to work with all parties to maintain a basic service to the main towns and villages in the county. Did Councillor Lena Milford turn her microphone off? Somehow we had a few hands up. Thank you, Councillor Ruffith. So, did any, any members have any questions to raise of our members on the combined authority? I can't see any questions. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Did, 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 sorry, the format is to put your hand up. Okay, so anybody who wants, I can see Councillor James Hopper would like to speak, and I'll come back. Thank you, Chair. I have a question about bus services. At Stagecoach's recent devastating announcement of its intention to abandon 18 bus services across Cambridgeshire has caused extreme distress and anxiety for thousands of South Cambridgeshire residents who stand to be affected. One example of this is the 915, which connects Royston to Cambridge by Melbourne, Shepworth, Falmere, Foxton, Harston and Trumpeton Park and Ride, and provides vital links for everyday life. People use it to get to essential medical services, jobs, for their livelihoods, and to apprenticeships and training, and to carry out 
uh, caring responsibilities. There is particular concern for those who absolutely depend on travel with a concessionary bus pass or who live with mobility or visual impairment. Some residents are asking whether they can continue living in their current homes. So my question is this, will the leader be asking the combined authority to intervene to restore these services? Thank you very much, Councillor Hobro. Uh, Deputy Leader, do you want to respond? Yes, please. I was both extremely disappointed, in fact angered and indeed shocked to learn the cuts to these services, which will impact users across the county and will affect detrimentally the lives of many of our residents in South Cambridgeshire. Stagecoach have broken their unwritten social contract with communities by removing their independence to get around in their daily lives. As you point out, people in some cases will simply not be able to access jobs, education, services and amenities. The public purse has subsidised buses throughout the pandemic and this is a real kick in the teeth. Our board member, Councillor Smith, and her deputy, Councillor John Williams, have been urgently working with the other board members and the mayor on immediate measures to replace those services that are being cut. I understand that the mayor issued a mayoral decision notice yesterday and tenders are now being put out. In the longer term, the combined authority needs to progress as fast as possible plans um, for bus franchising or other ways of increasing public control over the broken bus system. Thank you, uh, thank you Deputy Leader. Uh, I believe also Councillor Dr Bhattacharya would like to speak. Yes, thank you Chair. So people have started, um, started panicking in Camborne as as they have come to know about about the uh, about the withdrawal of this buses service and especially 18, the parents, the teachers, the students of the Camborne Village College, those who live in Camborne, these have started panicking, and 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 um, I have received the emails and message and lots of messaging message I have received. The question is that how can they continue their journeys? What answer? What answer should I should I uh, should I should I carry from this uh, uh, from this council to my residents? And I also have another question: What emergency support or alternative support can you provide as a council to the uh, to the residents of the of the South Cambridgeshire? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Bhattacharya. So, what answers can this council provide, and what other solutions are there? Thank you. Um. As I've just mentioned in my statement, I think the solutions are really working with the combined authority to put something in urgently and also in the longer term to be looking at, um, well, progressing the bus franchising so there's a little bit more control over what happens because obviously currently Stagecoach, are, they're a private company and there isn't any sort of say-so from an authority on where you put your roots and what you do. And I completely sympathise with the point you're making. Thank you. Uh, so then we have Councillor Lina Nieto. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, um, Councillor Rico, for got those mic comments. Oh, sorry, I can't yeah. see. Okay. You can hear me. Just sit right? by your laptop. I learned from my last time. Chair. Um, so it is very disappointing that we find ourselves in this position because surely the discussions took place months ago. This administration, I believe, plays a big role on making sure that the combined authority is delivering the best transport services for our residents and communities. So I would like to know what has the leader of this council and the representatives to the combined authority done to make sure that the combined authority allocates sufficient funding for the services across the rural communities. Thank you. Deputy Leader. So what has the leader done to ensure CPC has uh, uh, assigned enough funding for the, to replace these services? Um, aside from what I've already mentioned, um, in answer to Councillor Bhattacharya's um, question, I don't really have anything else 
you know, to answer. I, perhaps the Chief Executive, or indeed a Councillor John Williams, may have a little bit more information since I don't sit on the, um, I, I'm not the representative for, from this council on the um, combined authority. Councillor John Williams, would you be able to answer that? Uh, yes, I, I, I wasn't part of the last uh, meeting of the board um, that was attended by Councillor Smith. Um, but so far as what uh, the combined authority is doing now, uh, it is using its emergency powers to tender for those services that uh, are being withdrawn uh, or changed. Um, clearly, Stagecoach gave the statutory 56 days notice to the Traffic Commissioner for the withdrawal and changes to these services. And until that happened, the precise nature of the changes were not confirmed um, so the combined authority is having to work in a very short space of time in order to uh, tender for those services that it now knows are either being cancelled or rerouted. And um, we wait to see what, um, what wait to see the, res the response to that tendering process. Thank you very much. You didn't want to come back to me. Thank you, Councillor Nieto. Would you like? Thank you, Councillor uh, Williams and Rippet, for your comments. I would like just some reassurance that those attending and representing our communities, that this local authority and the combined authority are going to make sure that this does not happen again and that they do everything in their power to secure and put any kind of procedures and system in place to make sure that our communities don't go through this um, situation because people are heavily are distressed and they shouldn't be going through this. We should be doing everything that we can to make sure that our residents don't suffer. I completely agree with you. But the, this, the situation we're in is as a result of deregulation of the bus services, which was made back under Margaret Thatcher, um, means that we have very little control over the bus services. Uh, they, 95% of bus services in the county are operating on a commercial basis and Stagecoach operate most of those bus services. And unfortunately, no one has the power to force Stagecoach to operate a commercial service. It is down to Stagecoach how it operates that service in terms of fares and the timetable. That is the situation that has been given us by the government. Um, so we have very little control over um, the local bus services. And I'm, I, I hope, therefore, we have your support to, um, to bring in franchising for our local buses so that we do have control over what happens. I look forward to Conservatives supporting that because that's the only way we will avoid this happening again in the future. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, you're next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Oh, perhaps I should declare an interest because my son actually goes to Long Road, which I'm going to mention now. Um, Your interest is noted. Thank you. Um, of course, the, the, the news came as a shock, um, but it was even more of a shock because whilst we, there was a list that said these are the list of bus routes being withdrawn, what Stagecoach seems to have also done is change some routes, like the City 4 route, and removed <laughs> the service. Not just rerouting, it removed it. And what that means is that uh, villages from Bourne, Coldicott, Hardwick, and down the uh, Madeley Rise now do not have a service because City 4 now just goes from Camborn straight into um, Science Park. So what I would like to actually ask our representatives is to find out if the measures that the combined authority 
uh, has exercised in tendering for the withdrawn routes. Um, actually includes routes like City 4. Thank you. Your, your point being and that of course, that's a hidden change because it's not listed as a removal. It's, it's listed exactly. as a change which has the effect of removal. Correct. So. And what that means is children like my son and his friends and those from other villages who go to Long Road and Hills Road now have no means uh, of getting to school. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr Hawkins. Um, thank you, Councillor. So, just to answer that, um, there is a meeting of the board on the 4th of October um, and clearly things will be a lot clearer following that board meeting in, at the beginning of October. Um, at the moment, we don't have that detail to be able to answer that question. Thank you very much. Deputy Leader, did you want to come I was just going anything? to add that um, as soon as that detail is available, um, a written answer and will be sent to Councillor Dr Hawkins. Thank you very much. So, written answer then. Uh, oh, sorry, yes. Mr. Watts, go ahead. Sorry, just to correct John Williams, I think the board meeting is on the 19th of October. Um, but, but you may be talking about a transport committee. But we will certainly, I'll contact the chief exec of the combined authority today and try to get a, an answer as quickly as possible. Um, picking up on that point, um, it takes quite a lot of scr close scrutiny to pin down routes that have altered in the way that Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins mentioned, where the route is apparently still present, but um, in fact has been altered in such a way that it has the effect of leaving out some villages. So I wondered if we could have a list that refers to all routes that have been altered, so, so people can actually look at the... Um, Look at the look at the routes and see how they affect them, because there are you know otherwise they don't know they're not alerted if the route is still there and it on the surface looks the same they wouldn't know to look for such things as Councillor Dr Hawkins has found. Thank you. So Councillor Dr Ellington, you're the next one. <laughs> oh sorry. School of life. Councillor Ellington. <laughs> oh, like that bit. so well supplied with such a well educated people amongst um, whom is Councillor Ellington thank you um, I, I think we're doing an awful lot of hand wringing which is entirely appropriate I'm sure but I'm very much one for thinking okay so what does this council have that is special and that is councillors in all our villages who can identify how such very simple um, changes in routes have affected. And can I suggest that as a council, we collate from our district councillors the specific issues that are affecting their residents. In Swavesey, the village is a mile long. You can say we've got a the guided bus, but if you live at Boxworth End, it's still a mile to get to the bus. And they are taking off the number five bus, which goes through Over and Willingham. It means that the people who live in Boxworth End, and anybody through the village really, cannot get to the Over Doctor's Surgery, where they have, there are a very large proportion of um, people from the village. So it affects my village particularly. And I just feel that with the added um, concern around congestion charging, people do not want buses to be taken off that were taking them into Cambridge at a cheaper rate. Um, so I'd suggest we... Oh, uh, the other thought that was in my head was our community car service. Can we build it, support it, and give it more oomph. While to, because there are a number of villages, thinking of Lola, which never has had a bus service and still doesn't. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Ellington. 
Um, and I've just spoken to Liz Watts, who said if members would like to send the details of the way that the alteration in the bus route has affected people in their village, she will collate that data um, as our um, deputy chair. No, do you send it? So Liz will share that information with the CPCA. So members, thank you very much for that suggestion. Um, we'll add you to the bottom of the list. Thank you. So, um, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I have to say, from from it'll be quite an easy uh, way to say about changes for most of my villages because most of them don't even have a bus, um, which is a, a sore so subject in itself. I'm sure we'll agree. Um, so I'm going to seek some reassurance, and I hope you'll forgive, Chair, that I'm going to focus on the politicians of the day, not decisions from before I was born on this subject, as the lead member referred to, because I don't think that's particularly helpful. Um, other local authorities have managed to not have this situation, and what we have seen is money you know, not going to the combined authority, because of a lot of issues that have been going on in the present today at late. So I would like to know from our board representative or their substitute um, if very clear answers, Chair, if that's doable, for um, do we think that this is having an impact in the fact that franchising has been possible uh, all this time and yet doesn't seem to be progressing? And there has been clear support, I think, from different parties on franchising to clarify the earlier comments. Um, and uh, also, is this not ringing alarm bells for the administration that buses might just not be the answer to everything, particularly when they're considering having that as the only alternative for congestion charging, Chair? Thank you very much, Councillor De Deputy Leader. Okay, I will answer that as far as I can. Um, in a way, you could also say this is at least highlighted the situation and uh, addressing it and brought it forward and made it very relevant and pertinent at this time um, to you know grapple with this and absolutely understand the best way to do this um, again that's that's really me, me in a nutshell on that one <laughs> um, did, I wondered if uh, councillor John Williams, who might have anything to add on that. Which is why I was asking John Williams if he could. Yes, I, I, I totally agree with Councillor Williams. We are where we are, but we are where we are because of previous government policy and present government policy, which gives us no power over our local bus services. And um, yes, um, it's been an aim of the CPCA to look at introducing franchising, but that doesn't happen overnight. You know, that take, it's a long process, and, um, and it may, you know, some people may feel that it should happen overnight, but uh, unfortunately, if you look at elsewhere uh, where franchising has been introduced outside of London, and actually it's only been introduced in Cornwall and Manchester so far, and it has taken years to get that done because the bus operators are very much against franchising for obvious reasons. Um, so we are in where we are, I currently agree with you, and where we are at the moment is that we have no control over what Stagecoach does. We can only react to its decisions and we are, the combined authority, I'm sure you, is now reacting to Stagecoach's decision. And um, at the moment it's too early to say the outcome of, of their efforts. Thank you very much. Chair, yeah, there was a part of my question I'll answer. Sorry, would you like to say what the part was that you feel has not been um, answered? Whether our representatives feel that the current issues in the senior leadership of the combined authority have led to partially not being able to progress things like franchising and helping to avoid the situation because, as I say, plenty of other places seem to have been able to manage this situation far better than what we are seeing. Thank you. Um, 
Okay. Uh, uh, and clearly, um, Councillor Williams doesn't look at local news because if she did, she would realise that this isn't Wait, just happening. This, this, the, the, the cancellation of bus so services. Williams, will you just, I want to answer yes, Councillor Heather Williams' will you just, question. Will you, will you listen to her uh, uh, question and then come back? Point of personal explanation, I do read the local news um, and watch it, um, and therefore any accusation of I go yes, uh, is inaccurate. Thank you. You may retract it if you like. Thank you. Councillor oh, well, I, I'm, well I, I'm pleased you do, because if you did, you would recognise that in Milton Keynes, then in Northampton, then in Bedford, and in, and in Norfolk, and in Suffolk, and right across this country, bus companies are withdrawing bus services. If you go to Bedford, only last month, the stagecoach announced drastic cuts in its services in Bedford. If you go to Milton Keynes, there are drastic cuts in bus services happening in Milton Keynes. This is a problem that is happening right across the country, outside of the metropolitan areas. You know, rural bus services are under attack, and it's very little that local authorities can do about it because we, are, we have not got the powers from government to stop it happening. So if Councillor Heather Williams wants to help us, she can go to her government and ask them to change the chair. powers that local authorities have so we have greater control over our local bus services. Thank you. Did you wish to make... Yes? Point of information, it is our government chair, as you normally remind us, well but also okay. that bus service improvement plan allocations have been in Blackburn, Bournemouth, Christchurch, Poole, Brighton and Hove, Central Bedfordshire, City of York, Cornwall, Derby City, Derbyshire, Devon, East Sussex, Greater Manchester, Hertfordshire, Kent, yes, and a yes. lot more. So, we hear your point. We hear your point. If you actually want to resolve it, you might want to think of something more up to date than Thatcher. No, point of order. Um, this isn't a debate. This is a question of an answer. Right. Yes. Yeah. Can I move us on? Uh, That's point, point of order. Um, this isn't a debate. The, 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 we need to address the, uh, our uh, question to the chair. Thank you. Uh, point of Can order. Um, one member of the council is persistently um, de, um, uh, uh, breaking the, uh, or, um, the orders, sending orders, and addressing uh, uh, other members, not as the chair. Thank you. Um, I have on my list. Uh, one, two, three, four people who are, and I'm not going to take any more questions on this, so uh, da Councillor Dan Lentell, Councillor Bhattacharya, Councillor Brian Milnes, and Councillor Luther Halings. I'll take those questions, uh, and then we're going to move on. Okay, so Councillor Dan Lentell, and I, can I ask you to keep your questions and your answers prompt, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, promptly, um, the reason I'm sitting here is I have lost confidence in the leader of this council to represent the needs of our residents at the, across the stakeholder map. And my question to my colleagues in my uh, once and perhaps future party is this. Isn't it time that we took our candidate, the chap I voted for, for mayor last time, isn't it time we took him off the naughty step and sent him in to bat as our representative because what this council needs is better representation, proactive representation. And I, my question is a very simple one. How can we expect change if we don't make the change start with us? Thank you. Deputy Leader, would you like to answer? I'm not responding on such a personal sort of question to somebody. I don't think it's the position of us to do be doing that. It doesn't actually get us anywhere. Okay. Uh, the next question we have is Dr. Shrabona Bhattacharya. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a bit confused with some mathematics. What type of mathematics or the mathematical, mathematical equation is this? Firstly, asking the, I mean, um, firstly, taking the public buses off from the routes and then asking people to pay the congestion charge. How can these two systems fit together? Take the buses off and then you ask for the congestion charge. I think the point is that two different authorities have done those. Well, one authority and one 
operator have done this? I still need a I still need a valid answer to give it to my uh, to my residents because I'm I'm, I'm sorry, constantly we getting your messages question. and the emails. We hear your question, um, but you've raised that point earlier, and I think you may wish to raise it under a different item in the agenda. But Deputy Leader, did you want to pick that up? Um, I was going to say different agenda item, really, yes, exactly. and also. There are a number of questions to follow on agenda item 16. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think it's a. Um, well, that's your that's the answer that deputy leader has given. So moving on to Councillor Brian Milnes. Thank you, Chair. Um, so under the current circumstances, we've had um, debates about what we can do as a council um, and what the confines authority can do. Now clearly we've seen limitations from both the previous mayor and the current mayor in terms of progressing franchising which we generally agree although it's an imperfect system is the only way that we can involve ourselves in more control over our buses and we whether or not we think they're the perfect vehicle to use the pun uh, for delivering transport services to our population, they are the only um, option that we have right now. And we should, uh, and uh, I'll ask here, that we ask our mayor and combined authority to expedite franchising. It's being thought about for, for too long. We um, have worked in circumstances where um, uh, Boris Johnson's built bus pack better uh, which was originally funded uh, to the amount of three billion was slashed in half by the treasury. Um, uh, we've uh, uh, had a, a situation where in Manchester uh, the franchising uh, had to be delayed while Stagecoach took Manchester to court and it lost their argument to not be uh, franchised. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a difficult process. So. Uh, I ask the leader if uh, we will make representations to bring franchising forward as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's kind of been covered in the, my yes, opening exactly. statement, I think. Um, thank so, you. Thank you. Councillor Palings. I'll... With, withdraw it from now and I'll leave it until we've got the debate. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, and remember, th those were only questions for our representatives on the CPA, CPCA to take to the CPCA. Thank you. So, in the similar light, can we be careful how we frame our questions for the next item, which is 13, Greater Cambridge Partnership. We're invited, uh, sorry, before we go ahead, I'll take it then that we've noted the report. So, item 13, Greater Cambridge Partnership. We're invited to note any report, but since there is no GCP Executive Board report available for this meeting, because its next meeting is the 28th of September, an update will re be reported at the next meeting. Um, but members, did you have any questions for our representatives on the GCP? Councillor Graham Cohn. Thank you, Councillor Cohn. Uh, thanks, Matt Chair. Chair. Um, I know I've raised this point on a number of occasions, but um, given that the um, uh, Cycle Greenways project was brought up on the 8th of September at the uh, GCP meeting, I was wondering if you could, um, uh, well, through you, Chair, ask if I could have an update on the Fullbourne to uh, Cambridge route and some timescales on that, because the timescales in the document alluded to uh, 2025 on nearly the whole route without any detail as to, um, you know, when bits of that route are going to start, where the problems are, whether there's staff resourcing issues, and uh, I, I have asked this of the GCP 
GCP before but had no detail at all and as local member my residents deserve to, to know what is going on with that route. It's a huge population on the fringe of Cambridge that could uh, have a very different modal shift in the city if this project that was commissioned in 2016 was to actually move forward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to take a moment's legal advice, if I may. So, okay. Um, I'm just thinking that that's really a, a, you're seeking uh, an update from the GCP, which I'm suggesting that we ask our representatives on the GCP to ask at the next meeting and bring back. Yes? Absolutely. I'd be very happy with that, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Councillor Brian Mills? Yes, I think the um, uh, delivery of the Greenways project is a concern for all of us uh, and has taken rather longer than anyone uh, would be happy with. Uh, so, I'm quite happy to uh, make sure that we. Uh, have a written answer that is in more detail as Councillor Cohen requests. Thank you. Now I apologise. Did, did you, Deputy Leader, do you want to? Um, no, just um, the same thoughts as regard Water Reach Greenway, with, and mm. my, myself, my ward colleagues are pushing for that. I'm sure you are, and I'm sure Councillor Mills will raise that one too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, item 14. Uh, sorry. Councillor Heather Williams. Oh, sorry. Councillor Heather Williams, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, probably more of an observation, as we don't have a report to question on. Um, but one of those is that even when we do all agree, we've already demonstrated when we don't, but when we do all agree, we still don't seem to be able to get anywhere on, on, on this because Greenways has had, been supported from everybody. Um, so if our board representative could reinforce the um, ex I know, exhaustion of the subject uh, for residents and councillors alike, I think that would be welcomed by all. Um, I'd also, Chair, in the, and I have raised this with officers, and I think this is something more about how the GCP supplies information, but on the combined authority, we do receive reports from audit and corporate governance and scrutiny panels. For the GCP, we only get the board, obviously there is the assembly as well. So I'm just, um, putting a plea to you, Chair, if you could look into how we can make sure that that's balanced correctly um, and fairly across the outside bodies. I, I personally don't see any reason why the reports from the Assembly don't come to us as well as the Board, but that could just be an oversight. I will find out, but not here. So I, I, I don't know. and I, I, It's interesting because I have often been uh, concerned about minutes, but I'll ask. So moving on to item 14, we have the update on the Oxcam ARC, which is on pages 129 to 132 of our agenda. So may I invite Deputy Leader to speak to this? Thank you. As we have discussed previously, we are waiting an indication from government about the strategic plans for the ARC. It is important that we remain engaged with work in this area because it could have a large impact on our district for good and or, or for bad. And I am happy to attempt to answer questions on this. Thank you very much. Uh, would anybody like this? Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, so the ARC has been something that we've we have debated um, in this chamber on this item um, quite a bit. And one of the things previously that has been um, by myself and colleagues pushed is the transparency around the meetings that are there. Um, previously, it has been said to us that it's government initiative and it's, you know, government decide. Um, but the government have pulled out of this. This is now being led by the leaders of, of this area. 
Um, and even when government was in control, allegedly, of this, I called for our leadership, our inclusion into this, to be based on, on transparency and a requirement of that to be to see minutes of the meetings. Because I have to say, I've sat in this chamber, we get a four page, few bullet points. We've asked and asked and asked and never had a response as to what actually the vision is here um, from our representative there. What is South Cambridgeshire pushing for? And unless we can actually see, there's nothing in here that says what the vision of the administration is and how we are being represented at that meeting. Um, and I think it's about time, Chair, that we saw. So is there, my question is, is there any chance of us seeing or knowing what at all is going on? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, a couple of points, um, hopefully to answer your question. As we said, this is a new reiteration of it and we are in with the new government, new, um, new, new Prime Minister and new Secretary of State waiting for that steer as well. But I think you make a fair point possibly about the agenda minutes um, and uh, you know, can we take that away to, you know, to look at? Thank you. Okay, um, so we come on to, yes, yes, and we note the report. Thank you. So we come on to item 15. Uh, which is on pages Roman 2 to 3 of our agenda papers. This is the members of committees and outside bodies. And the purpose of this item is to note and endorse any changes in the membership of committees which have been made in accordance with the wishes of the leader of the political group to which the seat has been allocated as well as to agree any changes required in membership of outside bodies. So coming to 15 Roman I, uh, firstly, we, Council is asked to note that Councillor Sunita Hansraj has replaced Councillor Dan Lentel as a member of the Grants Advisory Committee, and that Councillor Peter Sandford has been appointed as the first substitute member of that committee. So, will Council just note that? The second item is that Council is asked to note the appointment of Councillor Peter Fain as substitute member on the Civic Affairs Committee and on Climate and Environment Advisory Committee. Uh, Roman 3, we are next asked to note any other changes in membership or substitutes in respect of any other committee. So, Councillor Williams, did you want to go? Uh, thank you. Um, the appointment of myself to scrutiny under the third spot that we now have following the political reapportionment. Thank you. That comes slightly later, later down on. the agenda. Is that later on? Yeah. No, I'm just saying that's the only change or appointment I need to make. That's it. I'll hand over to um, legal advisor. It, it's actually not that complicated, but uh, thank you. It was done previously when we considered proportionality. It was appendix B, I think, to the report, so it was covered there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, but you didn't have any other changes that you wished to make. Thank you. Um, right. And then 15 Roman 4, members were then asked to note the appointment of substitute members to the Joint Local Planning Advisory Group. And as stated on the agenda at page 3, nominations received from the Conservative Group are Councillors Heather Williams and Graham Cone. And um, so Councillor Judith Ripith, are there nominees for substitute members from the Liberal Democrat Group? Um, yes, there are. Um first substitute is Councillor Peter Sanford, and the second one is Councillor John Lovelock. Thank you very much. And uh, under item five, 
Are there any other changes to memberships of any other joint bodies? No, I can't see any. There are none. And are there any changes to appointments to outside bodies? No, there are none. Okay, thank you very much. So, under 15, set little Roman 7, uh, finally, we're asked to endorse the appointment of Councillor Sue Ellington as Vice Chair of the Grants Advisory Committee, and I propose that we endorse this appointment. Um, may I call for a seconder? I don't think it's called in. Oh, sorry. I said I propose that we endorse this appointment. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Dan Lentell. That's fine. Thank you. So we do need a, I think we need a vote for this one then. Can we do it by affirmation? We can do it by affirmation. Okay, right. So are we agreed to do this by affirmation? Agreed. agreed. Anybody against? Anybody abstaining? No. no. So members, we therefore agree those changes uh, by affirmation. Thank you very much. So moving on to item 16, uh, which we have listed on page Roman 3. Members, you're reminded that a period of 30 minutes is available for questions. This includes those questions where notice has been provided as set out on the agenda. And if there's any time remaining after the questions with notice have been dealt with, we'll deal with any other questions which have been notified to Democratic Services Manager before the start of the meeting. So we're going to, I'm going to invite uh, councillors to ask their questions in the following order. So firstly, Councillor Dan Lenter. Thank you, Chair. Does the leadership of this council share my concern that the inclusion of the hospitals at Addenbrooke's in the GCP's proposed congestion charge scheme is likely to derail the wider proposals and sink any chance for better public transport in Cambridgeshire? Thank you. Deputy Leader. As you point out, these are proposals, not decisions, which will in all probability go out to consultation this autumn, obviously dependent on the decision of the board on 28th September. It is essential that as local members we encourage as wide a demographic as possible to take part in that consultation to inform the debate and to make the scheme as equitable as possible. It's essential that we remember that the sustainable travel zone within which there would be a road user charge is to help fund a much improved bus service. As you indicate in the premise of your question, if quality of access to medical care is essential, some patients and visitors do not own a car, either because they can't afford to or they can't drive, sometimes due to a medical condition. Presently, not all of, all of those residents have access because there isn't a cheap, reliable and frequent bus service. Equally, for many residents who come from farther distance to a centre of excellence such as Addenbrookes, currently the car would be their only option. This is why the consultation process is just so essential. Thank you. Councillor Lentel, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, this is my supplementary question, which is why on earth was Addenbrookes ever included in these proposals from day one? And this is exactly the kind of policy shaping from the start that we need to have as re representatives of our people representing our people to the wider stakeholder map rather than the wider stakeholder map to our people. This is looking down the wrong end of the telescope. So Why was this ever question, included for on day one? I just want to emphasize again, though, that obviously the boundary is a difficult area, always going to be complicated where you exactly put that boundary. But there is a consultation process, you know, probably about to start. And the inclusion or otherwise, whichever that, that becomes, you know, whatever way it goes, is also thinking about 
you know, who can access there? And it, we need to think about those people who do not have a car, who probably can't access it currently because of the um, lack of the bus services to get there. And additionally, also um, may have a car, but with escalating fuel costs and the car parking, it's not about just about those people who can afford to drive there. It's also about as wide a demographic being able to access the place as possible. And so it, it is in there. And please can we ask as many people as possible when the consultation comes to really respond and put forward their views. Because it's not just about obviously us in this room, it's about everyone you know, who lives in this area and also lives beyond this district. Thank you. Moving on, our second question is from Councillor Graham Cone. Would you like to ask your question? Thanks very much, Chair. So um, my question is, um, uh, what does the leader think is the fairest way, um, uh, what is the fairest way to to stop those that can least afford paying the congestion charge, um, give, given the proposals indicate um, exemptions for those with low incomes. Thank you. Deputy Leader. I'm going to ask um, Councillor Mills um, to answer this. So it's a little bit more detailed, and he is all over the detail. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Councillor Cohen. Amongst those who can least afford it are some 20 to 30 percent of the uh, resident population who don't have a car, and so are very reliant on a, a very unreliable bus service. And boy, have we seen how unreliable that's going to become very shortly. In my inbox this week, we've already seen tales from. Uh, students uh, being left in the lurch uh, because uh, the driver shortage means that the uh, stagecoach decided to remove without notice uh, for three hours a vital bus service and students being left um, uh, unattended or unserviced. The impending cost of the living crisis has underlined the urgency of creating a reliable, affordable, attractive and sustainable public transport system. Without that, people on low incomes may well be excluded from access. And we've, we've seen today in the earlier debate how immediately uh, the loss of uh, cost services has, has become, instead of which this proposal looks to increase the frequency, reliability and reduce the cost of bus services. So I think the proposals do um, include, as you say, a discount for low earners. So we, this proposal is looking to look after uh, the uh, least uh, well off in the, uh, in the area. Have you finished? I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham. Was that too quick? No, I just, you didn't indicate that you'd finished your answer. That's all right. Oh, sorry. Councillor Cohn, do you have a supplementary question? I do, Chair. Thanks very much for that um, answer, <coughs> Councillor Milne. So, really, the point that I was getting at was how is this going to be administered? Because I think you're right to say that there are a lot of poor people, um, you know, in South Cams and, and the wider area that don't have access to a car. There are also a lot of poor people that um, do have cars and they drive into the city or the surrounding area to, um, to undertake work that isn't very highly paid and they really rely on their vehicles to do that. But really the, the, the premise of, of the question was it's a Liberal Democrat led uh, GCP have you thought about the fact, how is this going to be administered? Is it, um, you know, uh, people on certain incomes? Is it certain welfare? 
how is that going to be administered? Do people have to apply for the exemptions? You know, I've got residents that are writing to me that are very worried on low incomes, asking, will I be exempt, will I not be exempt? And they're worried about it in a cost of living crisis. That, you know, that they want to know how is it going to be, um, you know, administered, will they be exempt? And there's no detail at all in these proposals that have been put forward. Councillor Mills, do you want to answer that? Yes, I do, Chair. Thank you. Um, it's fair to say that the, um, the less well off, uh, actually, the proportion of their income uh, going into looking after and fueling uh, a car, a personal car, uh, is disproportionate to those who are better off. Uh, so it's important that we uh, look after uh, as many of those people as possible. Um, you're right in terms of uh, lack of uh, exact detail at the moment, but bear in mind these are proposals that are going out to consultation. So uh, uh, these issues of how we administer uh, the schemes are uh, in, well, you're saying you haven't seen them, but they, they are under consideration, but haven't been brought forward. But the consultation that we're likely to be embarking on uh, may well inform uh, those, those details. Well, um, sorry, this you're, is a you're question asking... and answer session. Thank you. Would you allow Brian, Councillor Brian Wells to give his answer? Well, the, the, the consultation is to, to take into account people's views on all of these issues, and they will be germane to the details that come forward. I think there's, there's a, something of a, a horse and cart issue there. Thank you. Um, under 16C, I've received notice this morning from Councillor Dr. Richard Williams that he's withdrawn his question. So we move on to question 16D, which is from Councillor Carla Hoffman. Would you like to ask your question, Councillor Hoffman? Thank you. Can the leader explain to residents how they can ensure that they have their legitimate concerns about the city access proposal, which is regionally launched by the GCP, heard and responded to. Thank you. And I think probably the Deputy Leader will try to respond. Um, Ms. Councillor Mills. Oh, Councillor Mills, yes, over to you. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Hoffman. So, um, you bear in mind that the series of consultations that we've already done um, with regard uh, to these transport strategies going back five or six years or, or, or so now, and include um, such examples as the Citizens' Assembly, uh, which tried to uh, reach a much wider demographic than we'd previously done. And we can perhaps take models from the uh, um, Greater Cambridge uh, Shared Planning Service, who um, uh, did that public co consultation um, in the Corn Exchange, uh, which uh, reached a, a lot of people. And uh, clearly, the city access is actually a separate uh, pr program uh, from uh, the current proposals for a charging and um, bus improvement program. But the city access talks about how those buses and other transport are going to get around the city. So there, there is a linkage between the two. So there will be uh, significant amounts of uh, opportunity to consult and clearly we will get a um, broad picture of people's concerns which we can then act on and particularly concentrate on those issues that are most important to most people I mean, that, and that's the purpose of that consultation exercise and we certainly will uh, in all of this we've already had discussions at the board GCP board uh, about the consultation process and make sure that it doesn't look like some tick box exercise, that it really gives people ample opportunity to express their views. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, the city access, uh, there, there are uh, groups of people that clearly, whether you're a pedestrian, whether you're uh, a bus user, whether you're a cyclist, are of uh, maximum concern to you. Um, and we will uh, hopefully get some sort of resolution to as many of those concerns 
that our uh, residents have. So I hope that will uh, uh, encourage uh, people to take part in those consultation exercises. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Um, and can I remember, remind members, I know it's difficult for members who are straight ahead of me, but if you could continue to address your questions and answers to me, because then we can hear you through your microphone. So, Councillor Hoffman, do you have a supplementary question? I did, but he's actually answered it, so I will draw a second question. <laughs> I was going to say, it was a very much. full answer. Thank you very much, Councillor Hoffman. So, moving on, Councillor sally -Ann Hart, then. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've had several mentions already this afternoon of the GCP, so my question is, can the leader explain the democratic processes that exist in the running of the GCP, which ensure that residents of South Cambridgeshire have appropriate influence over the decisions that are made by this body? Thank you. And Deputy Leader. Yeah, th thank you for your question. The Greater Cambridge Partnership was set up as the governance part of the city deal to address the issue of transport, connectivity and access to Cambridge, bearing in mind a buoyant local economy and high predicted economic growth. The three decision makers on the GCP board our senior elected representatives from each constituent council, Cambridge City, Cambridgeshire County Council, and South Cambridgeshire District Council, ourselves. There are two non-voting members, one from the University of Cambridge and one from the Combined Authority Business Board, to add a broader expertise and input into discussions. The Joint Assembly has an advisory and scrutiny role, which further strengthens and broadens the democratic process. At the last meeting, which took place on the 8th of September, I watched the morning session online when the city access agenda item was addressed. There was, to me, I felt um, a democratic and open debate in the public meeting with questions from both councillors representing different areas and from members of the public. This part of the structure helps to ensure the GCP is both transparent and accountable. Thank you, Deputy Leader. And Councillor Hart, do you have a supplementary question? Thank you, Chair. I do. I'm, I'm really hoping this wasn't answered <laughs> in the answer we've just given. I apologise. Um, I'm, I'm just really thinking in terms or with reference to the, the current governance model within the GCP. Uh, can the leader remind me when the GCP was, was established? Crikey, yeah, that's the, <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, right. the um, GCP was set up in June 2014, it was established there, and it actually opened, I think, started work in June 2016, um, before I was councillor here, um, with the government as one of the signatories to its establishment. Thank you very much. So, moving on, uh, our next question is from Councillor John Lovelock. Thank you, Chair. Um, can the leader, please explain how the residents of South Cambridge as a whole will benefit from the city access proposals recently announced by the GCP. Thank you very much. And I believe Councillor Brian Wills, would you be fielding that one? Thank you, Chair. So the population of South Cambridge, uh, uh, we know live in this donut surrounding the city, uh, will be among the principal beneficiaries of the scheme. Um, uh, and this is along with the wider travel to work area, which reaches as far as Boyston, Huntington, Ely, and Haver Hill. Um, the, the, um, the city access um, proposals are about delivering a, an internal structure within Cambridge City uh, that will allow uh, the uh, sustainable travel zone to operate properly. Because without that, we might for example, get bus congestion. And um, so um, South, South Cams is, is critical because of those rural villages uh, of which we're largely comprised, uh, as well as the new towns, will need to have services uh, that can uh, reduce their reliance on uh, individual use of, of motor vehicles. Um, you know, the... Um, I think I don't want to repeat too much that, that I have in uh, an earlier uh, answer, but if you bear in mind that the, um, 
GCP's proposals for city access um, are following um, are an, and are aligned with the EU aspiration and policy document of reclaiming city streets for the people, chaos or life. And that's what we're facing, um, where uh, pollution uh, is responsible for the death of 100 people a, uh, a year, uh, then we need to do something about our uh, city streets. Thank you. And um, Councillor John, uh, sorry, Councillor Lovelock, do you have a supplementary? And could I ask that members try to keep their answers um, brief? Thank you. Councillor Lovelock. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, as coming from Cottenham, you very much realise, looking at the proposals, that they're very good at providing radial routes, but so far I haven't seen any proposals for improving the circumferential routes across village rink links. For example, Rampton still has nothing, no bus at all in the proposals, uh, and Cottenham has two buses in Alpha, none to the train station at Water Beach or the guided busway. I just wondered if the leadership thought that these were important aspects to bear in mind in providing good linkage, which gets people out of their cars rather than think it's easier to drive to Water Beach by car than just to catch a bus into Cambridge and go back out again. Thank you very much. Uh, I note that um, Councillors Hart and Hales have left. Thank you. Councillor Mills. I think this is circumferential. Uh, routes issue um, is one we've uh, pondered uh, and is um, clearly we've seen today about uh, you know profitability of bus service uh, and, and what you can do on a, um, a reasonable uh, cost basis. So demand, uh, demand response um, transport um, is uh, something that we're being uh, uh, that we're experimenting with uh, in hunts at the moment and seems to be quite popular so that may be uh, part of the answer. Um, I'm not sure that uh, right now I can tell you any more uh, than that, other than it's a, a significant uh, part of the conversation. And, and you will have seen that at one time there was a proposed proposal for circular routes joining up the path of lights, for example, as we extend those. So there's uh, proposals uh, going to come forward for extending or, and even moving New Market Road. There's um, uh, planning application already in for a uh, new park and ride by um, uh, the west of the junction uh, on the M11 uh, to improve uh, those park and ride services then that would be potentially part of that solution. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you Chair, as on the order paper. Uh, so I think, Deputy Leader, you're planning to ask. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your question. Um, any organisation really worth its salt has to look at its efficiency and the skill sets it requires. Indeed, it is part of being a responsible organisation, especially when taxpayer funding is directly involved. Furthermore, it would, need, it would indeed be helpful if the government could commit to providing funding certainty to ensure we have the people and resources we need to deliver vital services without needing to make savings. However, projected changes to the business rate retention scheme and the implementation of the fair funding review will certainly result in significant reductions in funding to this council in future years. We are having to plan for how we might manage these reductions, but we have committed to do all we can to avoid redundancies in the future where possible. We will work closely with officers and the unions to achieve this, but we must be honest with our people and it would not be honest to guarantee there will be no redundancies in the future when this might be outside of our control. I can reassure members um, and officers that in, within this organisation that if any redundancies are considered in the future, they would be subject to a full consultation process. Councillor Williams, did you have a supplementary? I do, thank you, Chair. Um, my supplementary is whether, taking on board what has just been given as an answer, whether the administration is happy with the following that was sent to all staff. 
As we have often spoken about, there was already a need for the council to make financial savings in future years. This offer, related to the pay offer that was being made, would add in a requirement for further significant savings on top of that. We of course remain committed to working with colleagues, keeping them informed and minimising any reductions in posts wherever possible. I will write with a further update once further talks with the unions have taken place. Now, if I was an officer chair, I read that, don't take your pay offer. If not, we'll have more people made redundant and would have influenced decision making. So my question is, is the administration happy with that wording that was sent to all staff? Or were they not aware? Councillor Heather Williams, could you remind us the date of that correspondence? Uh, it's on Insight, Chair. Still there, I believe the 19th of July, but it might need to Thank clarify you. the date. But it's publicly available on Insight. Um, I'm not sure that Insight is publicly available. I think it's only available publicly to twice. members uh, and councillors and staff. Thank you. Um, Richard, I'm you going to... Something? Sorry, I left that on. I'm going to be honest. I hadn't... I haven't seen that, but that's probably my my mistake for not having looked at insight in, enough. So um, I don't feel like I can answer that because I, I haven't actually seen it. Um, so. I think Chief, it's okay. Now, I'm happy to take Sorry. a written response if that helps as to whether the administration is happy with that. Right. Okay. We'll try and summon up a written response for you. Thank you. Uh, the next item, uh, Councillor Mark Howell is happy to receive a written response as he's not able to be present to ask his question. So we'll move on to item 16, little i, from Councillor Sue Ellington. As on the order paper. Thank you very much. So, uh, Deputy Leader. Um, you'll be glad to know, Chair, that the answer to this one is short, and the answer is no. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Ellington? Yes, maybe somewhat frivolous, but I note that there is a very large sign, picture sign, in reception, which identifies all the Cabinet members and their roles. It must cost a bomb to produce. So I hope we don't have too many changes because it will cost the council a fortune. Thank you. I'm sure the councillor mind all that. Councillor Richard Stobart, your question is next. Thank you, Chair. So my question, um, can the council leader please explain why seeking the support of residents when making radical changes to current transport practice is fundamental to the success of those changes. Thank you, Councillor Stobart. And um, Councillor Brian Mills. And uh, we can remind members we've got four minutes left, so if you'd like your answer short. Thank you. I'll try and whiz through this. Um, as well as being a legal requirement, it's clearly important to seek the input of residents when making such significant decisions and actually have them genuinely feel that they've been part of the decision-making process. Why the consultation is such an informal, in, important factor. Thank now, I'm sure other members like myself will have been approached by the public with a variety of genuine and real concerns about the proposals as published. Unfortunately, not all of them have been informed on the accurate representation of those proposals, but that is part of the process that we will have to address. Um, um, if there's one message from today, it's that we shouldn't forget this linkage between the proposed road charging with a significantly reduced fare structure of whether £1 or £2 per journey. And uh, the, the linkage is between those reduced uh, bus fares and increased bus services, which, of course, are directly impacted by what uh, bus services will in, uh, inherit after today's, or yesterday's announcement from Stagecoach. Thank you. So, Councillor Stobart, do you have a supplementary? 
I do, but I think it's probably better to move on to the next question and make Thank sure you very we much. fit it in. That's yeah. kind of you. So, Councillor Lisa Redruff, your question. Do you want to take it as on the paper so we can get the answer? I'm pretty sure that. Thank, Thank you very much. much. So, uh, Councillor Milnes, are you going to respond to this one? Yes, thank you. So, um, Councillor Redruff's question raises an important issue uh, impacting our ability to mo uh, meet our own local uh, zero carbon targets. Um, there's a, uh, an inherent problem with the uh, supply of electricity, um, both the, in, uh, from the national grid in terms of the generation of uh, enough electricity, and as well as local distribution companies like UK Power Networks, who have advised that there will be significant constraints. In fact, in the case of our own um, uh, refuse service uh, and trying to electrify our vehicle fleet, uh, there wasn't enough capacity in the local grid uh, to uh, charge more than three of those lorries. Um, and that clearly gives you an indication of the sort of problems that we'll continue to have to address. That's why the GCP were looking at uh, uh, prime pumping, uh, building of uh, two additional uh, substations to improve the local grid capacity. Um, but of course, uh, what we're doing at Waterbreach is bringing forward a, a proposal to have our own solar plant, uh, which will provide capacity for uh, 30 vehicles or so to be charged. Uh, and the more generation that we can do gives us much more resilience against the vagaries of the utility market. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Milnes. And I'm going to call a halt there because miraculously we've got through all the questions. Forgive me, Councillor uh, Redrup. We, I, we're almost certainly out of time. I had it as 06, so I'm going to hold, call a halt there. I'm also going to call for a five minute break. Uh, Comfort break. Oh, there we are. <laughs> and as if by magic. <laughs> so I suggest we uh, we pause the live stream and let people know we're having a break and come back uh, at. Oh gosh, can we manage five minutes or are we? Let's say ten. So can I say quarter past that we return into the hall? Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, so welcome back, uh, members, uh, uh, to the council meeting on the 22nd of September. So we're at item 17, notices of motion, and you're reminded that a maximum period of 30 minutes is allowed for each motion to be moved, seconded and debated, including dealing with any amendments. At the expiry of the 30-minute period, debate will cease immediately and the mover of the original motion, or if the original motion has been amended, the mover of that amendment, now forming a substantive motion, will have the right of reply before the motion or the amendment is put to the vote. So, we start with 17A, the motion from Councillor Papalings, which is on page Roman 5 and 6 of our uh, agenda papers. And um, Councillor Halings, would you please move your motion? Thank you very much, Chair, and through you. So I don't think it's any surprise that I'm bringing this motion after we just had the driest July on record for 20 years, which has you know, definitely shown that we've got a water supply crisis. But also, just recently, the most shocking results of the levels of faecal bacteria, E. coli, um, in the waters of the chalk streams of South Cambridgeshire. And that includes downstream waters from hazling field sewage treatment work. So that's from local monitoring. So here in South Cambridge, we've got this perfect storm of a water supply crisis that's leading to low river flow, which means that any of the sewage and pollution that goes into the water is higher concentration level. So that's, that's this perfect storm. So the motion's got four distinct but interrelated actions. And there is something around the legislation. So it's the legislation brought in last year around um, water companies and the storm overflow discharges was heralded as resolving the problem. But the Environment Agency, just in July, has shown that this isn't working. So in the annual environmental performance assessment for 2021, which looks at the nine water and sewage companies in, in the country, said that this was the lowest performance overall since the beginning of environmental performance assessment. That's in 2021, after supposedly all of the measures to actually improve this and make it better. So the chair of the Environment Agency said that they were appalled and that it's the company directors that are letting this happen. So the fines are not having an impact and in fact they're just costed in to the budget. So they're just not creating the change that's needed. And Anglian Water, one of the worst polluters on record in England, got a two-star rating in 2021, a two-star rating. Um, and that's at the same time, you know, when the boss was handed over 330,000 bonus as part of a 1.3 million pay package this year. So, you know, we're just not incentivizing, disincentivizing the right way. So we should support the calls from the chief of the chair of the Environment Agency to increase criminal liability for CEOs and boards for liability and responsibility. Um, but we've also got to look at what are they liable for? And that's where we've got to increase the ambition. So just... This um, August, there was a new plan from the government, which is the Storm Overflow Discharge Plan. And under that, by 2037, we'd have 50% of all of the storm overflows improved. So this is the new sort of tighter controls. And I think what we've got to look at is short-term and medium-term targets to actually say, no more dumping of raw sewage in rivers and chalk streams. That's what we've got to aim towards, not to an improvement of the ways in which we do the storm overflow and the dumping. And how will we know this is happening? This is the next element of that. Well, the reason that Anglian Water is being investigated through an enforcement procedure by Ofwat is because of the poor quality of the monitoring that they're doing. And that's monitoring that tells us about the water quality. So when I mention the hazing field fecal bacteria, that's done by a volunteer organization locally, by Cam Valley Forum. So they are being held up for not having the, the monitoring of their own um, sewage dumping monitors, but also the water quality. But actually, they are working with rivers in other parts of the um, area to create bathing status. Now, under that bathing status, that means you get guaranteed water quality that's safe. 
And under the new plan by the government, they will only be monitoring those that have got bathing status designation or sites of special scientific interest. So where but our area with the precious chalk streams should have that status. They actually want this status. They want to work with the local authority to get that status because that will enable them to invest in the monitoring. Those within Anglia Water that really want to, to work on this. And then finally and unambiguously, we know that because of this low river floor, because of the water supply crisis, because of the limits that this is going to impose on us, being able to provide the services and the new housing that's in it, that you know, our communities need, the Stantec Water Report said that we need the regional infrastructure for water supply now. And we need the government to act on that. And that's why we're asking for this public-private investment in that region. It needs to be accelerated, brought forward to deal with that crisis. So I just hope that you will support um, this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And do you have a seconder? I do. Councillor Jeff Harvey, do you wish to reserve your right to speak? To the end? I, I will speak now, if I may. We'll speak now. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so in July, um, I, I was at my daughter's graduation ceremony where the guest speaker who was there to accept his honorary doctorate was the CEO of Anglin Water. And picture the scene. There he was, dressed in a ceremon ceremonial robe and a sort of floppy cap. Um, actually rather in the style of Henry VIII, um, addressing a very large auditorium. And he said, don't believe everything you read in the press about water companies. He was telling the next generation of teachers, health workers, lawyers, engineers, and scientists, water companies are champions of our environment. But actually, you don't need to read it in the press because almost as he spoke, an update on the Environment Agency's annual assessment was being published on the government website. And in the foreword by Emma Howard Boyd, the chair of the Environment Agency, she said, and this was in her opening remarks, the sector's performance on pollution was shocking, much worse than previous years, she writes, and repeat offenders can now expect criminal prosecutions where once the Environment Agency would have used civil powers. We would like to see prison sentences for chief executives and board members whose companies are responsible for most serious incidents. We would also like to see company directors being struck off so they cannot simply delete illegal environmental damage from their CV and move on to their next role. So I think to see that kind of invective in the introductory comments on a government agency um, website or on the government the government's own website um, just shows the magnitude of the problem so when, when you think about the CEO's comments um, to a captive audience with no right to reply um, against that background of a, a damning assessment by the Environment Agency um, it, it does rather seem that the CEO of Anglin Water is at the very least in denial but perhaps you might say cynical. And the same cynicism is evident when Anglo Water attempt to infer that this is somehow all due to climate change, and that's what's created the problem with storm overflows. But storm overflows, per se, they claim are no, fit, no longer fit for purpose, but in reality, storm overflows uh, only should be in operation um, in storm conditions um, and, and isn't actually the underlying reason that the FFT as it is called Harvey, the... I'm going to have to call you to a halt you have three minutes to, okay. to second the motion sorry okay yeah um, so um, there is a lack of capacity in the smaller um, sewage treatment works themselves and a joint statement by the Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty, EA Chair and Ofwat Chair, has assessed the dumping of raw sewage in a joint statement saying, this is a serious public health issue for government and regulators and regulators, and it is clear that the water companies are not doing enough. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Harvey. Um, I understand there might be a, an amendment to this motion. 
Yes. It has been seconded. So I understand there might be an amendment. Okay. Sorry, we're just putting that on the screen because it's been received in advance. I'm seeing your lovely face, Ms. Dawson. Thank you. So there's the amendment. Um, I'm going to read that out if anybody's listening. Uh, that given the seriously water stress status in our region, I think that should say, the council's call for the leader to write to Cambridgeshire MPs to urgently seek the support necessary for a sustainable water neutral approach to development to make sure that all new developments don't abstract more water than what it is already planned. Sorry, there's some tidying up that needs to be done there. Sorry, for that area and offset the remaining. Sorry, Chair, I'm just including the person after that. Apologies, I think when I was talking to Rebecca, we, we didn't um, delete that, so we're going to delete Sorry, that first. Could, could, which, which part of the um, motion are you seeking to amend? Whereabouts on the motion are you seeking to make the amendment? Yes. It's a last one. It's a last bullet point. So this is an amendment to... So if you re... re the, you the last bullet point. The blue. Okay. So that currently reads that given the seriously water stress status in our region, the CEO and leader will call on Cambridgeshire MPs to urge, urgently seek the government support necessary for investment in the regional scale water supply infrastructure called for in the integrated water study evidence base for the draft Greater Cambridge Local Plan. So I understand yes, that's Jen, what so you're you delete government and you include um, public and private investment. Yeah. So you want to insert the wording in blue? No. No, that then needs to be deleted. So it will then read that given the seriously water stress status in our region. Yes. Okay, so there's some wording that's extraneous in there. Yeah. Moving on, the CEO and leader will call on Cambridgeshire MPs to urgently seek the what? The support necessary. Oh, the support necessary. Okay, we've got the word government crossed out. So the support necessary. So, but there's no amendment. As I understand it, if we put into red, public-private, so they've taken out, the, the amendment is suggesting take out the word government and add in public-private before investment. If you put that in red, then you'd see that. That's the change in that um, paragraph. And then you have an addition to the recognition to overcome through river pollution partnerships. That's an additional paragraph. Sorry, thank you. Given the seriously water stress status in our region, the CEO and the leader will call on Cambridgeshire MPs to urgently seek the public slash private support. As it is on the screen, Anna. Okay, sorry. Somebody mentioned public and private, so fine. It's on the screen there, Anna. The support necessary for public, private investment. I see. Sorry, the support necessary for public-private investment in the regional scale water supply infrastructure called for in the integrated water supply evidence base for the draft Gator Cambridge local plan. And then the additional words, this council recognises that to overcome river pollution partnership work between the local authorities is critical. So we need a comma between river pollution to overcome river pollution, comma, partnership work between the local authorities with key stakeholders is critical because pollution takes place from multiple sources. And what I suggested that that is inserted before, at the end of the last paragraph before this council agrees, because that's a, a statement of recognition of, of what's necessary and then we go into this council agrees. 
Thank you. Right. Okay, members. Finally got that right. Um, I just want to check whether the mover of the motion accepts that amendment. I do. Thank you very much, Councillor Halings. Uh, so that then becomes the substantive motion. Right. So would anybody like to speak to that? No? Okay. So we'll go to the vote then, members. So, Councillor Nieto. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to, I'll be very brief. Um, so I welcome this motion and thank you, um, Pippa, for um, the changes um, to, to it. Um, it is very important that we protect our, our chalk streams from, from pollution. And as we all know, this work has already been, um, it was kick-started by our MP, Anthony Brown, and he has been pressing government and the local water company to strictest targets in government, um, has included also amendments on the environment bill on storm flows following the concerns uh, raised. So it is, it has been already established and it's great that we keep on pressing because there is more um, that we, that we, that we could do. I also welcome the call for further funding for regional scale water supply infrastructure. Um, but I also believe that this local authority has the duty to protect our precious chalk streams. And we can achieve that by making sure that all new homes are built to the highest sustainable standards, making sure they are future proof and ready to be retrofitted so that in the future we can successfully implement water neutrality. And the action is required now. And I know that Pippa has mentioned that she fully supports water neutrality. So I look forward to working with her on this. Thank you very much. Um, we also had a request to speak from Councillor Martin Khan. I think you put your hand up. Oh, before we vote. Certainly, we can do that. And Council Dan Lentel. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'd like to congratulate uh, the councillors for this excellent motion. Um, I have one point to, um, to uh, suggest from my time in the oil and gas pipeline sector, which is that when company executives became criminally liable for malpractice, it utterly transformed the sector. Suddenly, training became a lot more important, and suddenly knowing how to be compliant and how to exceed compliance became a lot more important to the people making the big decisions. So I think this is a step in the right direction. Um, to Councillor Haling's um, point number two about the formal application for an inland bathing water stretch along the River Cam, I think I'm right in thinking that only two such um, inland bathing stretches currently exist in the UK and perhaps we could actually double that number by having not just a stretch on the Cam, but a stretch on the uh, River Grey Twos, the most beautiful stretch of which uh, flows just to the north of Over and Willingham, uh, and perhaps even a site of special scientific interest next to RSPB Ooze Fen, which if you've not visited it yet, I can strongly suggest you do, because it is Europe's largest post-mineral extraction nature reserve, uh, Northern Europe's largest reed bed, and it's right here in our district, and it's an absolute jewel in the crown of uh, the River Grey Two's uh, basin. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lentel, and I'm sure if you want to suggest that as a uh, subsequent time, that would be uh, welcome at that point. Thank you. So, um, Councillor Heather Williams, did you wish to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm very pleased to see uh, that the motion and amendment has been agreed. Um, so thanks to both uh, Councillor Nieto and Halings for that discussion earlier. Um, I think we have tried on that practice of if it's something environmentally, then we, we give as much cross-party support as possible. And I'm really pleased that we've been able to achieve that today because these issues will transcend generations as well as political parties. It's something that affects us all. Um, and I, I welcome that, uh, you know, what's been before us today, some of the previous motions and indeed the work from um, 
our MPs. And I think if we are united on that, then we will have more success. If we look for division on environmental issues, then we will not be successful. Um, so I'm pleased to see that that's carrying on. And I think it's really important that we look at this in, in everything we do as well. This will only be achieved if everybody pulls in the same direction for the same purposes of trying to make, at the end of the day, what we should all be here to do is to make the world a better place for where we live. Um, so I hope that this emphasis on water protection will be looked at as well um, because there are things that we can do as a council um, and government needs to play their part as well, everybody does. Um, and I hope that when members of this council take housing figures and other things into consideration um, and concerns are raised, that they will be treated respectfully and that uh, it's something that we need to be really sensible about as we move forward. So um, pleased that we can show a united front today. And my thanks go to everybody, MPs, councillors, that are working on this issue. Thank you very much. And Councillor Brian Mills. I found myself in a strange position of wanting to uh, refer back to Maggie Thatcher. And this relates to the privatisation of the water companies. And there was a famous uh, TV interview, which you'll probably not remember, not having been born yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, we don't put raw sewage into the sea. And then they said, oh, sorry, Prime Minister, yes, we do. She was astonished. And um, we had years of membership of the EU where the number of blue flags that we got increased dramatically. And we made, made real progress in terms of water quality. And it's just sad uh, that we are now not under the same remit and we've already seen changes being made by the government that have diminished our ability to keep our water clean. So I uh, briefly would like to wholeheartedly support this motion. So thank you for bringing it to us. Thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to go back to Councillor Halings to sum up. Thank you. And this is, of course, now the substantive motion with having accepted the amendment. So, <coughs> Councillor Halings. Thanks very much. And I thank everybody. Um, hopefully they will now vote for this motion, seeing as we seem to have that kind of cross-party support. And that is what's going to be absolutely critical. We do... Thinking back to what Councillor Brian Mills has just said and also um, what Councillor Jeff Harvey noted, I am really, really concerned because as we came out of the EU, we were supposed to absorb all of our environmental laws into UK law. The Water Framework Directive is what provided us with the water quality indicators. Two months ago, that was removed as a water quality indicator, was removed from our national auditing on environment. We no longer use water quality as an indicator for the state of nature. We've removed 17 out of 24 environmental indicators in our state of nature report this year. Water quality being one of them. And that's why it is so important to consider things like locally, the bathing status, because that will give us some powers because it will require the monitoring but it doesn't mean, therefore, that we're going to be able to ensure that all of our waters that don't have that status have the monitoring that's necessary and we can ensure people that they have both the water quality that is safe for use by humans and that will provide the habitat for the wildlife that we need. I am very, very worried that we are going backwards and that at the same time, there is a cynical behaviour by the water companies. Now, I know that there are very good people within the water companies that are trying to do the right thing, but at the CEO level, when it gets to the board and CEO level, it's a bit like the stagecoach thing. It's all about the profitability of where it's going. So we have to make sure, through this motion um, and through the Environment Agency, support them to make sure that we've got a properly regulated market, if that's the way we're dealing with it at the moment. But I have to say, the August plan for the 
If you look against surface against sewers and everybody who's been campaigning on sewage discharge, the August plan just released by the government sets out that by 2037, we'll have 50% of those storm overflow discharge systems as being improved and no target yet for zero dumping of sewage. So we need to continue the work that began that's been mentioned, but we absolutely need to, um, to make sure we don't lose ground on this one and stop it, to stop the dumping of raw sewage. Thank you very much, Councillor Hayling. So I haven't got any other speakers, so I'm going to move us to the vote, members. So uh, the proposal is on page uh, Roman five and six of our papers. Uh, we're going to conduct an electronic vote unless, no? If everybody's happy and we're cross-party, are we happy to take this by affirmation, members? Would anybody like to oppose that or abstain? No? Okay. So, members, uh, we accept that motion, approve that motion from Councillor Pippa Halings, uh, and that motion is carried. Thank you very much. So, we then move on to uh, item 17B, which is the motion originally from Councillor Bill Handley. It's on pages Roman 6 and to 8 of our agenda papers. In the absence of Councillor Bill Handley, I believe Councillor John Williams will present this motion. Councillor John Williams, I invite you to present the motion. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, regrettably, uh, Councillor Hanley can't be with us today. He's ill, so I've said that I would uh, move this motion on his behalf. Um, I do hope that we all agree in this chamber that there is a cost of living, living crisis. Um, I hope that there is no one here who uh, doesn't believe that our residents are facing great hardship this coming winter and in fact, it could go well into next year as well. I was interested to see that the Bank of England this afternoon has already suggested that we are in recession. So, you know, those on low incomes in our district are having a terrible time and will have an even greater terrible time. Now, I know that the government is proposing a mini budget tomorrow but all the indications are from that uh, uh, that um, it's not going to be targeted at the lows on low income. It's something called trickle-down economics, which I understand has never worked, has not worked in the US and hasn't worked here. And so, unfortunately, I don't have much faith that it's going to improve the lot of those on low incomes this winter and going forward into next year. So this uh, motion is in two parts. First of all, it's what we as an administration would like to see the government do to support our residents, uh, particularly with their energy bills, because it's energy that's driving to a large part uh, the recession and the increase in inflation. And the second part of this is what we can do as a council, the powers that we have to help uh, those in the most uh, dire situation. On the first part, it's clear that we believe the government isn't doing enough and is unlikely to be doing enough with its mini budget. And we set out in this motion what we as Liberal Democrats would like to see the government do, um, and we believe that's, that what we would like to do is in the best interest of our local residents. Hence, this is why we believe this council should be promoting those um, policies to the government. On the second part, I'm very pleased that this council hasn't waited uh, for this motion at this council uh, to already take action. And there are things that we have already done over the last uh, few weeks um, to help uh, those facing um, hardship and people who are in despair as to how they're going to meet paying their bills 
this winter. And, you know, I don't hear anyone actually disputing that that is going to be the case. You know, there is no one on any either side of the political divide who is actually not, uh, who is actually saying, no, that's not going to happen. I think there is a general consensus in this country that it's going to be a very tough winter for those on low incomes. Uh, even the new Prime Minister has acknowledged that. So we need, to enable, we need to make sure that as a council we are doing all that we can to help those people. So already we have um, given advice in the council magazine. Uh, we are providing a, a dedicated page on our website and we have already started uh, working with Cambridgeshire Acre and with the County Council on the provision of warm hubs in the district. I understand that next week Cambridgeshire Libraries are going to come forward with a plan um, to provide um, warm, warm uh, places in their libraries. Um, and then it goes on to what we can actually Councillor do Williams, as a council. So I do close, hope you. that you um, agree with these uh, proposals and that we can move forward and give every support that we can to those people who are going to be suffering this winter. Thank you. Thank you very much. And is your motion seconded? I believe Councillor Holings is seconded. Thank you. Do you wish to reserve your right to speak or speak now? Um, I'd like to make an amendment. Okay. And so I can reserve my right to speak to the, the amendment. Okay, okay, so if you wish to... But firstly, do you second it? I do second Thank you. So firstly, we're seconded. Secondly, would you like to make your amendment? Is it possible to put on the, the screen the amendment? I have that. Um, so yes, I, first of all, I'd like to thank both Bill and um, Councillor Bill Handley and Councillor John Williams for um, bringing forward this critical motion and declaring a cost of living emergency. Um, and you know, recently I've been speaking to charitable groups running food banks you know, from Harston to Camborne, and they're seeing an increase, and they're seeing an increase not only in the number of people coming there, but also the families that are coming there. And some of those are young families that were, during COVID, were helping out with the food banks, and now turning to the food banks for help because of the increase in rent, the increase in food bills, um, and obviously in energy. And so when we talk about energy, I would just like to make um, an amendment to the motion, which was that... Sorry, Zed Hailings, could we just clarify? That is a, a replacement of point Roman 5 at the bottom of page Roman 6 on the agenda. Yes. So it's the whole section called, which currently said... Council, Council the October to, Energy so Price you're replacing rise. it with this new one. Could we just give members a moment to read it, if, if you wouldn't mind? Thank you very much. So can I explain that? Yes, I have a question myself. But if if I can explain, explain that. that so first. obviously many, many families are relieved with the um, energy price freeze which has been announced. And that is helping a lot of families. But we can't ignore the fact that a 2,500 bill that everybody's facing is double the amount that was in the October price cap last year. And we already know that many families struggled with that decision to either heat the home or feed their families over last winter. So 1,200 was already very high. And we've got to think that the October this, um, energy price freeze to 2,500 is for those who have gas in their homes for heating. So there are those who've got bottle gas, there are those that are on pay, um, prepayment schemes, and there are also those in South Cambridgeshire who are reliant on oil for home heating. And the government has announced a £100 one-off payment support 
to those families in, across the country who rely on oil for home heating. So we found the research um, I've just shown is that in South Cambridgeshire, we've got 17% of the population rely on oil. So that's about 9,350 families. They're looking at a 1,500 price increase in their oil bill. So the 100 pounds is, it's kind of not even touching the sides. It's a drop in the ocean when they're facing that. And they face it as a payment full to fill the tank. So it's not spread out over the year. So that's the first item there. Second item is about the fact that there is no, we've just talked about food banks. I think food banks have become the safety net that before the welfare benefit system was, you know. We now need this targeted support for those who cannot afford the 2,500 or anywhere near it. And we're suggesting that we double the warm homes discount to 300 pounds. And it's for everyone on universal credit and pensioner credit, because at the moment it's limited. And then don't get me started on insulation, because that's how we actually properly make sure that these bills are affordable in the long term. Okay, so members, we have an amendment. Uh, so let's just be... Um, just a moment. Sorry, yes. Are you saying that you uh, accept the amendment? Uh, Chair, yes, I accept the amendment. Sorry. To... Right, whenever you'd like to speak to the amendment. Uh, so I have Councillor Lovelock, Councillor Drew. Thank you. Councillor Lovelock, do go Thank ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I totally support the amendment, except... Um, a number of people in my ward and others who you live in park homes uh, rely on bottle gas. And the oil is a special case. I think bottle gas is also another case, and I'm not sure how it's covered by the current government proposals. So I think oil and bottle gas, I'd like to see, but I'm happy to take any comments on that. My impression was that bottle gas was mentioned in the amendment. No? Okay, right. Um... I mentioned it in my words, Chair, because I said that it's not in the amendment, but that both prepayment schemes and bottle gas should be looked at. Thank you. And Councillor Drew. Um, just to be sure, am I speaking now to say that I support the motion as a whole, or am I speaking yeah. specifically to the amendment, because I want to speak to the motion as a whole, so I may have put my hand up at the wrong time. That's fine. Um, if you wish to speak to the whole motion once we've agreed on the amendment, then... You can wait. Right. If you, would, yeah, if okay. you wish to speak to the amendment now, you can speak now. John Williams. Sorry. Sorry, Councillor John Williams, I know you're, you're going to say it's been accepted, so we don't need to speak to it separately. Okay. So, should we move into general debate then, members? <laughs> in which case... Well, so, in which case, Councillor Drew, would you like to speak now? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I am struck in relation to all of this by feeling a bit of a shame, really, and I mean a sense of national shame that we are in this position. Um, it's fantastic that working at county level and district level that we are doing warm hubs. Absolutely fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. It shows the caring, the compassion, the support, and it shows all the things related to the um, motion that's there. But what a shame that that is necessary. What an appalling situation to be in. And fundamentally, what this motion is surely pushing for is the fact that it's not necessary. There is no fundamental reason why this should be happening. And food banks are mentioned. I always recall a comment from the now government minister for business, who fundamentally explained that we should be proud of the number of food banks that we have. Well, as somebody who donates to food banks on a regular basis support it, I don't feel proud of the number of food banks that we have. I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed of the number of food banks we have. And every time I walk into Morrison's in Camborne and I pick up one of the green bags that are there and I buy one of the green bags and put it in my shopping, I feel a sense of shame. So actually, I totally support the motion. I totally support what's being called for. But actually, we should not pretend that this is necessary. We should not pretend our country should be here. It is a choice that we are here. And our government could be doing fundamentally more and for district councils at our level to have to be putting motions such as this and asking our CEO 
to write to the government to basically ask them to show a bit of humanity and to behave in a decent fashion. I'll use the word again. I call shame. Thank you, Councillor Drew. Councillor Williams, Heather Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've submitted an amendment to Democratic Services. Obviously, that's on the original motion, but I would accept that we were actually trying to take out the same bullet point. Um, so if we uh, don't worry about that part of the amendment, Chair. Sorry, did your amendment cover anything else as well? Yes. Yeah, OK. So could we see that on the screen, please? Just Happy to speak or wait until people have had time to digest. Wait to see it. So, okay. Okay, so we are in the text initially above the first bullet points. Um, so I'm just going to let you read that uh, and absorb it before I ask for any further comment. So, coming to Councillor Williams, are you happy to accept that amendment? Uh, I, can, I can't accept the whole amendment. I can accept some of it in parts, but not the whole amendment. So I don't know how you want to play that. If I can't amend the amendment, then no, I don't accept the amendment. Um, we take one amendment at a time. So, uh, in this case, just one moment, please. No, exactly. So, you've proposed it. Do you have a seconder? I do, Chair Councillor Cohn. Thank you. And would you like to speak? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'm not quite sure what the process is for what Councillor John Williams wants to do. Um, if you want me to we'll listen. Come later. Just speak to the amendment. So we're, we're working on the base of what's there in front of us. Okay. Um, so the, part of the reason for uh, bringing this amendment, I'll take it in step by step if that makes it easy for people. Um, this is a politically and will be politically charged letter, so we do feel that that's an inappropriate play, uh, position to put the chief exec in, and therefore we believe it's right that the political lead of the council should write to government. Um, we are asking for the word consider because we do feel it is a little irresponsible from our point of view to ask for these things with having no idea of the consequences of where the money will come from because we know that there, you know, somebody described it recently that all, we, all we've got really, even at the council, is sort of trade-offs. You know, we can't magic more money. So... I'd be very uncomfortable saying, yep, we're going to do all these things until you know exactly where that money would be coming from, because otherwise it's a pointless exercise. Um, the reason in relation to VAT. Now, I can understand the motivation around the v VAT uh, decrease, but I don't think it actually addresses the problem. And I'm going to go a bit accounting. So I know our chief exec will stay with me, but if, I, if nobody else does, apologies. Um, VAT is a tax on luxury items. Uh, and I think there is a definite, it is, that's the definition, it is a, on luxury items. And this is why, that's a definition, not my view, definition. And that's why I'm saying about reassessing the VAT rate um, goods and services. Fully support that. Sanitary products, in my view, should not have VAT. They should be zero rated. 
Okay. However, if somebody wants to go and buy a Maserati sports car, that is a luxury item. So why would I give a 2.5% decrease on the sale of that car? If you re-evaluate the goods and services on a case-by-case -case basis, you can then define what is zero rated, exempt, 5% or 20. But I think to do a blanket is actually, you know, given the comments made earlier, this would add to it. Um, just, if that's just to remind you. you, you have three minutes. I'm going as quick as I can, Chair. Um, so that shows that. If might have some questions on VAT, that'd be interesting, Chair. If we could take on to the next part, and this is the most important reason for the amendment, is that what we should be debating in this chamber, we don't even know what the government's doing, and yet we're already hearing speculation and we're trying to act uh, before the horse has even, you know, got up out the paddock. But at the end of the day, this council does have responsibilities. It does have a way of dealing with things. When we sat the budget this, uh, this year, budget setting process, our group fought hard and was refused to do a council tax freeze, with the lead member for finance stating that we should never not put up council tax. That was the attitude. Yeah, and, and residents will be paying that this year. So I have to say, if you're going to freeze the council tax, I'm going to welcome that. Of course I am. But you've already gone against that. And if you look going further down, which I know it's not scrolled yet, the things that we're adding on are real things that have a are in the control of this council. And I think before we start throwing stones what other people are doing, we should be getting our own house in order and putting congestion charging on top. And I do agree it's a cost of living crisis. I've referred to that myself. Let's stick to this is, um, It's in the amendment about congestion charging, Chair. That's why I'm referencing it. Um, I think the introduction of that uh, is really irresponsible at this time. So if we are going to criticise others, our own house should be in order first, um, and that's why I am moving this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Chair. Happy to take any VAT questions. So, firstly, can I ask um, Councillor John Williams? Oh, okay. So, would anybody else like to raise any questions? Councillor Hansaraj. Sorry, I just wanted to correct Heather Williams um, about. Oh, sorry, about there's no more tax on sanitary products. It was abolished in 2021, and also free sanitary products are available. Personal explanation, Chair. Go ahead. Um, so I use that as something that it hasn't been removed, it's zero rated, so it does fall in a rate boundary. I was using that as an example of something that shouldn't be, as opposed to, that's exactly what I said. That, that chair, that has been misunderstood, Perfect. what I was saying. Councillor Williams, we understand the principle. Thank you. Are there any other matters people wish to debate on this? Councillor Haylings? This is debating the amendment, yes? Yeah? Correct. For the amendment. And correct, we are debating Councillor Heather Williams's amendment. Thank you. Um, if we scroll down. So I, I would like to ask something on a little bit of point two, which is about council housing rents. The cross party um, group and board within the LGA has just signed a letter with the National Housing Federation asking the government that is about proposing a cap on social housing rent. And cross-party, it has said that if the cap is brought in without any additional funding for local authorities, all of the things that Councillor John Batchelor mentioned this morning about housing, we would be absolutely hobbled. So we must help residents with their housing rents, but I think what we have to be very, very careful about here is if local authorities are not supported with additional funding on this, we've got something that looks quite innocent here about helping residents, but the government policy at the moment 
would hobble local authorities so that they couldn't maintain the housing to the standards that everybody deserves as any kind of tenant. And it would mean that they, um, we wouldn't be able to um, continue to provide the critical services that are being for tenants and residents that are being um, mentioned here. So I just want us to be aware and alert of there's a lot behind that thing about council housing rents. And it's not in the local authority's hands because all local authorities represented by the local government association have all agreed to ask the government to deal with that one. So just so that it's not only in our hands, that one. Members, thank you very much. Sorry, we finished. Um, we've only got seven minutes left to six minutes left to sort out this amendment and take a vote. So, um, on, on, yes, on, on the whole thing. So, um, you are next, Brian Mills. Please, would you keep it short? <laughs> yes, Chair, I've got your message. <laughs> Good, thank you. So, you go ahead. I just want to check on a point of order that we have to accept. Uh, whether we have to accept the amendment in full or not. It has to be as, as it's presented, and I will be asking okay. shortly whether Councillor John Williams accepts it or not. I think he's already uh, said, and I agree with him. There's, we need to take a vote on that too, yes. So, yeah, can we move to the vote? Yes, that's what I was about to do. Thank you. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, the Dean of Group said in the Dean Corn. I know, I know, I'm trying to get there. I have a list here, six minutes, Councillor Milnes, Councillor Cole, who seconded it. You seconded it? Yes, sorry. I added an L in. Sorry. I'm happy to um, say no more on the issue. I think it's pretty clear that what our motion suggests, it's focusing on things that we can deliver at the council, and uh, I'm happy to support it. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so, given that, Councillor Williams, did you want to speak any further? You said that you didn't want to accept the motion. Yes, the yeah, amendment, thank you, sorry. Chair. I don't accept the motion, but I, there are three things, lots of things why I don't accept the motion, but just three things very quickly. In the amendment, why I, sorry. It's the amendment. Highly. I do not want to accept the amendment of three things. But uh, the, the, the amendment, not the original amendment, but this amendment. Um, right, first of all, on that, reevaluate good, good by, well, it's going to take years. I mean, you know, that, that, that is not going to happen. Ten, ten, our, we put council tax up this, this year by 10p a week. The government took away £20 a week from the, lowest, from the poorest families. So I don't accept that our 10p a week increase um, is, has, has a, you know, is going to cause a huge problem. Perhaps the government should get back the £20 it took from those in universal credit. That would make a, that would make a difference. And finally, nice try, but your last point about the congestion charge, I'm not going, we cannot, we cannot, um, you know, prejudge the outcome of the congestion charge consultation. Okay, so um, we need to go to a vote, members, on whether to accept this amendment. Please, can we conduct an electronic vote? So, please mark uh, the blue person to say that you're here, and green if you accept the amendment, red if you refuse the amendment, yellow if you abstain. We've got 19. Has everybody voted? Twenty-one. One person hasn't voted. One person hasn't voted. Oh, is it um, Corin? Have you voted now, no, Councillor Garvey? Yes. Yes. No, it's Good. not. No. Uh, yeah, there's 20. Oh, one, one no vote. Um, can we go ahead on the basis that uh, that falls on the basis of 21 against and uh, 
five in favour. Okay. Oh, we've got it now. 21 against. So that amendment falls. So, members, can we revert to the amend the, 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 the motion, which is now the substantive motion, including the amendment by the original amendment from Sir Uh I'm happy to move to a vote. Yeah, on the second to move to a vote. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's move to a vote on the substantive motion then, which is basically all those things to do with writing to MPs, etc. So again, if you could vote on that, members, press the blue button to indicate that you're present, and green if you agree, red if you oppose, yellow if you abstain. So again, we should be 26 in total, and we've got that, I think. I know there's one person who, ah, yes, there we are, okay. So that motion is carried with 21 votes to five. Thank you very much. Good. <laughs> 26 seconds, I'm told. I understand there were 26 seconds remaining, so. You'll forgive me if I got slightly stroppy there. Okay, moving on, item 18 is the Chair's engagements. I was delighted and pleased and sad to attend the Act of Remembrance. Uh, the Chair's engagements are there on the table, but also um, on the 18th of September, I also attended the Act of Remembrance on behalf of the District, uh, District Council at Great St Mary's Church in Cambridge. Um, and... Members, the date of our next meeting uh, is on Thursday, the 24th of November at 2 p.m. And I look forward to seeing you at that time. Thank you, members.